Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of City of Smack Live at the World Athletics Championships, Oregon 22. I'm Chris Chavez, joined by Dana Giordano, David Melly, and we've got our first guest on our hands here already. It is U.S. Marathon record holder and eighth place finisher in the World Championship Marathon, Kira D'Amato. Kira, you and I have, like, I guess this is the first time we're meeting in person, which is amazing. This and feels pretty epic for me. <laughs> I don't know how you're feeling about it, but I am real excited. How uh, is that true? How is that possible? Yeah. No, I don't know. I think it's good. Well, COVID, I think, was one year. I wasn't at too many of the same races. Have you been avoiding me? I think so. I even, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. That, that that's my, it may have been it. Um, so, Kira, I mean, how are the legs feeling? Legs are feeling good. Okay. Legs are feeling good. I think in that race, like, my systems broke down before my leg, so hopefully that makes for, like, a smooth recovery for me. But, um, yeah, I went for a run this morning, and everything felt normal and together, and they still work, so that's a positive. Sometimes after a marathon, it can take, like, a week or two before it starts feeling normal, so. Well, the the race was fast i mean it was a flat course what, at what point did you start studying up on the course and what to expect because we, we had emma bates on the show a couple of days ago and she had said like she went into this blind not really knowing who was in the race and also like what the course looked like and you get the last minute sort of call uh to join this team are you you know it's one thing to prepare you know with the mileage and the workouts but then you know kind of visualizing who's in the race and what to expect uh, how did you approach that side of things yeah as far as who's in the race like i knew the americans obviously with sarah and emma but i didn't look any past that and i even asked my husband i was like hey should i and he's like don't look <laughs> <laughs> he's like it's probably best just not to look so i went into like the competition blind but um as far as the course as soon as i found out i was doing it my agent sent me like the youtube video of it and then i came out and I ran the course two days before and then the day before i did like the trail part so i felt really comfortable with the course but um yeah, I wasn't too uh, sure about the competition, but I knew it was going to be, you know, it's world. So it's going to be <laughs> going to be hot. How much does something like Chicago and even uh, Houston prepare you for this particular race? Because it was flat and it was and it was fast. Yeah, it was. The course was awesome. I really, really liked the course. It was really flat. And there was a couple like little, I don't even want to call them hills. We'll call them like elaborate speed bumps. That undulations. Just up, yeah, undulations. <laughs> that's a good word. But that broke up the legs a little bit. So the course was really awesome. And I think had I just prepared a little bit better for a marathon, this really course would have been up my alley. Well... I think you can't really knock yourself for preparing better for a marathon. You found out what's the exact like number of days? I've been so saying three what weeks. What was the Friday? Friday, whatever it was at July first or second. Okay, so, so it was in July. You were going to do Peachtree on July fourth. I was going to do scheduled to go there. Right, so I was going to leave for Peachtree on. Yeah, Peachtree was a Monday, so I was going to leave on Saturday. So it was July first when I found out. So seventeen days. And and is it just like a mad scramble to like okay totally adjusting training and then like trying to devise workouts or were you just already somewhat in you know shape to just tweak things slightly to be ready are you always in marathon shape i don't think so okay <laughs> and i think like running monday i was like i'm not in marathon shape right now so um, definitely in the third loop i was reminded every step of that that i wasn't quite in marathon shape but, um, you know, you can't really cram for like a race like you would for like a test. So we switched out Peachtree for a 22 miler. And that was really the only change we made. Like if we would have added mileage, it probably would have just broken down my legs and not helped. So we kept it. It was actually like a regeneration week. We're going to like lower the mileage going into Peachtree, take like a week easy and then start building up for a marathon. So I just did a marathon at the beginning of my marathon build. So that sounds like a. <laughs> Sure, fire away for success. I'd like to rewind a little bit and go back to when I last saw you, because, you know, I've seen Kira in person before, yeah. but at Peyton Jordan. So at the beginning of the season, you kind of had your sights setting on this meet, but in the 10K. So, you know, you've kind of had, after that race, you were said, track isn't for me. I'm going to switch the gears. And we hadn't talked since then. So what was your season supposed to look like before you got the call up? Yeah, so I was doing Peyton Jordan because I was like, oh, this is going to be great. 10K on the track is going to be awesome. Not so awesome. <laughs> it takes me one track race a year to realize like I'm better suited for the roads. So um, we focused on the roads and we did um, the New York Mini and the Boston 10K. 25k champs where oh, yeah. i saw you oh yeah the 25 everyone champs. hangs out with kira except for chris <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was also a little premature for a 25k but that, that's <laughs> totally fine 
But um, so then we were going to like pull it back and then start chain, you know, training for a fall marathon. So, um, but yeah, this was similar to Chicago. I was injured like leading into Chicago and just started building up. So I felt very similar with my preparation for this race in Chicago. But from this, I was coming off of like a pretty good 10K season, which is Chicago was coming off injury. So I think that was a big difference. And then you, when the race actually went off, you actually sent it the hardest or early okay. of the Americans. I went in wanting to win the race, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Call me 17 call days of preparation. Of course you want to win. Call me crazy, but like, I like really feel like there's no one in the world that I can't run with. And um, really, probably about four or five miles in, I realized there's people in the world that I can't run with on Monday. Because <laughs> I was thinking, like, if it goes out hot in the low five teens, that's going to feel pretty comfortable for me. But it went out in, like, the five O's. I'm like, okay, well, now it's going to settle, right? And then I saw another, like, it was, like, 508, 509. And I'm like, okay, this is not, like, I'm barely <laughs> going to cruise in a marathon. This is not. So I had to, like, pull back. And then I could hear the chase pack with the Americans behind me. So I was like, okay, maybe if I just tempo a few miles and then just tuck into that pack instead of running in no man's land, that's probably the best uh, best way forward for me. And then, so up front, for folks who watch the race know, like there was some crazy fart licking happening in the lead yeah. pack. They were speeding up and slowing down. How much of that can you see? Were you, or do you have people on the sidelines yelling at you or could you even just see them kind of coming back? Then? Yeah, for a while I thought we were gonna catch them because people were telling us like 40 seconds ahead, 20 seconds. And it, even at one point, I think we were like 11 seconds ahead. And then we looked up and they were gone. So I think that's when they put in like that crazy surge. But I mean, I'm gonna go into every race I run trying to win it, you know? And I kind of learned the hard way that I'm not gonna win it. But, um, you know, I wouldn't change how I raced and I'm gonna do it exactly the same way next time too. There's been, of course, the amazing photos of the finish where it's you, Emma, and Sarah all embracing and celebrating. Can you speak a little bit to the camaraderie and like the, just the teamwork and the friendships I think that the three of you share together? Because, you know, those photos blew up. And like even Emma, when, when we spoke to her, had said that she, she's looking at, you know, the number of people posting it to her to their stories and the likes and the comments. And she's like, I didn't realize that something like this would mean that much to, you know, just so many people. You got your first sort of big wave of that, I think, in January when you broke the American record and just, you know, your story picked up steam everywhere. This was, you know, a display of, so, you know, three different, very different stories on a world stage and really showing like where U.S. marathoning is right now. And I think a lot of people took inspiration from it. So what, what have you made sort of, of of the reactions and what's that relationship like between the three of you? Yeah, both Sarah and Emma are awesome. And I think that we've all had a very similar marathon journey. We all did the trials together and then we all did the marathon project and then Chicago and then this one. So this feels kind of like our little marathon squad. So I got to like huddle up with them and see which one they're going to do in the fall. And maybe we can like keep repeating this. But um I was just so humbled to be on team with both of them because they are just marathon superstars. And I feel like I'm like just coming into the scene still a little bit and just finding my stride. So to be partnered up with them and actually on the way to the starting line, Sarah Hall took us aside. It was like, now I don't want to mess, mess up your race plans, but I mean, do we want to work as a team? And we were all like, yeah, heck yeah, let's work as a team. And then I just took off. So they are probably like, well, so much for that, Kira, you know, way to go. Uh, yeah, good plan. But, um, but that was really cool. And I think the caption I kept seeing was women supporting women. And like really Sarah finished over a minute before me. So she could have like done her cool down, gone and get, got a drink, you know, been celebrating with her family. But she didn't. She stood there and she waited for like the rest of her team to finish. And, you know, I'm just like eighth place and to be like the caboose of Team USA, I mean, is really, I'm getting like teary eyed, but that's really cool that like, you know, it's not the top runner in eighth, it's like the last runner on the team was eighth, you know? And I wish like coming down the straightaway, if the Japanese woman wasn't like so close to me, I probably would have been celebrating a little bit more, but I could feel them like it almost felt, you know, that dance move where someone like throws out a fishing line. Yeah, and, like, yeah. Reels, <laughs> reel it in. Like I could see them and I felt like they were reeling me in in a way and I feel like really like, getting like a little emotional but that's like really special to have like because we're also competitors but mm -hmm. also for them just to stand there though and like pull me through the finish line was really really special and then like I literally just ran like straight into their arms and they like caught me because <laughs> I had absolutely nothing left at that point but that's um you know I love that like 
you know, we can lift each other up, you know, and it was, you know, they both had really great days and um, I feel like I did the best I could, but it was just cool that they were there to support regardless. And if that's not enough emotion, Joni joining the three of you. That, that what, got my cold, dead heart. Like, I, I was tearing up watching the computer screen. It was... <laughs> what, did, what, did, what did she say, and what, was, what, what did that mean for you? So it was really special that she was there. She was the official race starter, which felt, like, really symbolic to me that she started really this, like, Ameri- like women marathoners, especially competing on a world stage. And so, like, figuratively, I feel like she started it all. And then literally for her to start the race that day, like, maybe that's why I went out so fast. I was all jazzed up from, like, seeing her. But having her, like, all three of us have grown up, like, worshiping Joni you know she's done so much for our sport so for her to come in and like embrace us in that way you know it's like kind of like a little bit of like we made mom proud a little bit I guess like that was like a really really cool moment that and like the fact that she even posted then onto her social media afterwards that she was like proud of us like it's really cool man I don't have the words I don't have the right (laughs) words but that was special so when we spoke back in December, you were saying that you'd never made a USC team before, which is why you were kind of aiming for it on the track. Mm-hmm. And you got the call up. You had qualified for world championship team, but our friend COVID threw a wrench into that. Mm-hmm. So what was it like finally getting the US gear? And the sec- <laughs> follow-up question to that is, how did you pick which uniform? Okay, well, I was... So finally getting the gear was awesome. And I'll tell you a real quick story there. I didn't have... My passport expired like a month ago, and you need to bring... a updated passport so when I got the call I was like I'm in I'm in I'm in they're like okay make sure to bring your passport so then I called them right back I'm like I just opened my passport like and my heart sank so I'm like is this like did I just lose this opportunity because I don't have like a (laughs) up-to-date passport but it expired like last month they're like it's okay we'll get you in just go get your passport picture and then they connected me all so I got that all done but I wore my like Teen USA gear for my passport picture like that's how proud I was Wow! so I go into the passport agency I wait like hours to finally get it and they're like you can't wear like (laughs) you can't wear USA stuff in the picture I'm like what isn't it just your face anyway (laughs) yeah that's what I thought that it didn't even matter but they're like you're gonna have to go get a new picture so I had to leave (laughs) out of the agency where you have to go through security and wait in like two hours of lines I had to go get a new one and I just come from working out so my new passport picture is me super sweaty <laughs> like looking like really tired and annoyed pretty much the, but um the hair best everywhere part is they they probably didn't know you were like it, it was team usa gear they're just like this woman is thrilled to be american well, USA, <laughs> USA. <laughs> she just got her citizenship she's getting her passport <laughs> i was so proud i'm like this is a way that i'm gonna be wearing team usa gear forever in my passport picture but yeah they nixed that so i had to go get a new one it was too american for them (laughs) yeah way too american but they said no so anyone out there passport don't put usa or military gear you're not allowed to do that i learned the hard way but i learned (laughs) the lesson for all of us um and what was the other part so i was really excited oh yeah so how'd you pick which one so emma bates posted to her story a little poll which i really appreciate the interaction because for there to be so many kits there is just really fun and you guys obviously you chose to. So to I match. didn't get to choose because oh. I think I was like the barrel of what was left. So they <laughs> sent me what was left and it was just the white one. But okay. I think I would have chose the white one anyways. Yeah. But I was when I saw Emma, I was like, hey, like you got options. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't get options, but I mean, I'm wearing white if you want to wear white. You know what I'm saying. You know, it'd be cool if we match. But really, since you have options, do whatever you want. But um, but her and Sarah both were excited to wear the white, too. So that that was cool. I think, like, in all the pictures of us, like, stomping around all matching and, like, the flying V was, like, really cool to be a part of that. So I'm glad we all matched. That was cool. Made for that, like, finish line picture even more, like, gusto. So after the the race ends, I mean, how hard was that in comparison to running the American record in terms of fatigue and, and the recovery that came after? It's only been a couple of days. Yeah, so it was a different kind of hard than when I ran the American record. Like, the American record, like, broke all of me. Like, my, like, hip flexor was done. My hamstrings were exhausted. Like, I couldn't run, I think, for at least a week after that just because my body went into a different type of, like, well that it's ever gone to. But for this race, I think that my body, my systems were just exhausted. And I hadn't been practicing fueling because you don't really need that for a 10K. So early on in the race, my body was rejecting any sort of, like, 
nutrition I was trying to put in. So I think that added to me just not having much on the third loop. But when uh, in that third, like I really wish the race was only two loops. I think that would have actually been like the perfect distance for me. But um, in the third loop, I'm like, this is why you train for a marathon. This is like the humbling marathons that you just like, you're like, I don't know how I'm going to run another mile, let alone eight more miles. But you just like, you just keep going and you just find a way. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a hard one. And, uh, it took like a lot out of me. I actually like ended up in the hospital the next day because I was like, just really like, I went to the well so hard. Um, but luckily because my systems failed before my legs, my legs feel great now. So I went for a run today. I'm feeling awesome, but that was, a, it was a really tough recovery. So the, on the course, I mean, we see the photos afterwards of the kids and your husband, like the, how, how was that sort of that, the atmosphere and the environment that the race provided? Yeah. I mean, that was so special, like to see them, like I saw my husband probably like two dozen times around the course. So I don't know how he's like such like a well, Tony to gets get around. Everywhere. He gets around <laughs> some man. way or another. Yeah. Around. Get, the, get the dude a bike and he's like <laughs> everywhere. But the kids were along the course and they were cheering like so loud for Sarah, Emma and I. And I think that made like all of us smile as we went by. And uh, it was cool that they could all be here and be part of that. And uh, with such like short timing, like the fact that like Team DeMalo rallied and lined the streets was really cool. Had you run any part of the course before? Yeah, on, um, on before Saturday. Before this trip to Eugene? No, this okay. is the first time I've been in Eugene since 2003. Wow. So it's been a while. Yeah, the last time, the only race, the Butte to Butte in yeah. Eugene, I did that in 2003. It was just like a fun training run in the summer. But How old were you in 2003, Chris? Uh, I don't know. Were you born? Maybe, yeah, I was definitely born. Oh, I was I'm, a I'm a 93 baby, so oh, 10. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So... As we've talked about before, you're basically my mom's favorite runner, in oh. including myself. I was like, about I think to I'm ask, second. even before you brought up your mom, <laughs> I was going to ask how your mom's doing. Well, so the, <laughs> the craziest thing happened on Monday morning, which, again, my, my mom likes track and running, but she's not like, she's not a fan. Like, she's not like mm -hmm. super engaged in the process. And she texts me Monday morning and is like, I'm following the women's marathon. I'm getting the updates. And I'm like, you are? Like, I don't think I've ever known her to follow a race that wasn't just one that I was running. And I think especially having it in the U.S. and especially having just so many compelling stories, uh, you know, in the women's marathon and, and you and Sarah and Emma being such relatable figures. What do you feel like this means, you know, especially looking forward to L.A. for mm -hmm. just American distance running, really engaging with a bigger fan base? I definitely think being in the U.S. played a really big impact on just the popularity of this. And like I've had people, you know, just reaching out about this that aren't even related, just some like real estate clients or someone that I'm working with is like, whoa, this is really cool. And I'm like, I didn't send you that. How'd you find that? So I think it's really reaching like a broader audience. And I think the fact that Sarah and I are mothers and in our later 30s, like we're reaching a different type of audience, too, um, which is really cool just to feel like more support and, uh, you know, just ra rally people. So so you wear a lot of hats, really, or as you mentioned, just one of them. I also really like just hats. Too. <laughs> you do love yeah. a good hat. Yeah. One of those new hats, though, is you opened up a running store. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about why start? A running store in your area and what the plans are for the store in the future yeah this threw a little wrench in that so we were gonna have the opening weekend somewhere around now but we're pushing it back so i can be there for that so i think maybe next friday or so but i think for me like when i first left the sport um it really broke my heart and i like stopped running altogether because i associated competitive running with running so i just stopped and then I started working at Potomac River Running in Washington, D.C. as their director of marketing. And I saw how to love running again through like recreational running. And that's like when I fell in love with running, like where, how I feel about it now. And so in just seeing running's more than fast, it's more than like goals or more than like a marathon. It's like just a way of life. And just being connected to the community in that way and learning that was a really like special time for me so um I want to replicate that and give that back especially like into my community which like before I even set the American record I saw people running down my street and they were cheering for me you know like they don't they just saw some woman out there running a lot and were cheering for that you know so I feel like I want to give back and invest in a community that's given me so much but 
you probably have some really cool memorabilia to put around the, the running store. Dude, so what's going to hang? Yes. Yes, I definitely, I'm going to definitely hang a singlet or maybe, maybe even the one I wore with um, the number. And then I'll definitely be putting up some USA gear there. Yeah. We'll do like an Instagram friendly like wall or something so you can like connect. Ooh, it takes but some I'll pictures have, like, in front little, of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll have like a little corner that will have like my favorite products and my favorite nutrition, my favorite like gear, what shoes I train in, what shoes I race in. So it'll be a way. And I really want to like swap that out with other runners in the community too. So then, you know, if you guys, we can do the Sidious wall or whatever oh, and cool. put your favorite like products and stuff. And so I, I plan to have that always changing so people can kind of learn about like other runners and the space. And still being a realtor as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a little crazy, but <laughs> I love it. You know, a lot of my family, but it's it's been fun. So yeah. You brought up the shoes, and this is something I think like Kyle is still recovering from the media eight hundred. <laughs> he was he was actually throwing up right after the race. Oh, and geez. so um did he, he win it or how did it he go? Finished second. There was a, second. A, a guy from uh was it Switzerland, I think, who yeah. wow. when he went big. He ran one hundred fifty four. Kyle ends up running one fifty seven. Um, not bad though. Not bad. Dana won the women's race though. Dana won the Dana women's race. It. We yeah. need more women out there next time. Yeah. So Kyle's always kind of obviously obsessed over your Strava. He loves seeing all the workouts. But in particular, I guess especially after the track ten K that you uh ran. He's got a theory that you're just like based off your form and stuff, you're super responder to the shoes, right? Yeah. Like, have you kind of observed that and like done any sort of research with the Nike lab or anything? So even before I was sponsored by Nike, I was a Nike wear tester. So I've been running in their shoes. I mean, this whole round two. So I don't know if I'm a super responder or if by running in them so much that I've like taught myself how to run in them. And I feel like I've become pretty efficient running in them. So I incorporate them now into like my um, interval runs, my tempo runs, and sometimes even my long runs when I need like a quicker pace that I want to recover from. But so I don't know if I'm a super responder or if I've taught myself how to run better in them. So that's a good question. So uh, obviously there's all these different great runners here uh, and throwers and jumpers and everything. Uh, one of my favorite moments of the entire competition was seeing Ryan Crouser and Shelly Ann do the victory lap together. It's very easy to run into people on the street in Eugene. If there's someone you're really excited to see out there, who are you, who are you looking oh out for gosh. in the next couple of days? I, I'm just fangirling all over the place. Like even like we had like our team USA pitcher. So I'm like, I'm in the same picture as all these people. This is unreal, you know? So I think it's really like everyone. And like I train by myself on the East Coast, so I don't really get to see a lot of these athletes. And being like a road racer, I don't go to track races and see all these people. So it's been really cool. And I'm fangirling over everyone here. You've yeah. got a little gold sparkle in your hair. Where did that come from? So my daughter, Quinn, one of her best friends, moms, has a salon, and she went to get it done. And so when I took Quinn, I was like, so, um, I mean, can moms do that? Like, is there an age I'm limit I'm running this big tinsel? race. Have you yeah. heard of it? It was actually before that. Okay. Like, we did it before... That's seventeen day old. It, we got some. We got some long tinsel in there, <laughs> so it stays for a while because it's like attached to like the top of your hair. But it's, um, yeah, it's been it's been fun. So how does a whole experience like this, just being part of Team USA, you know, they have like the athlete and the whole team hotel, and that whole setup. How much does that get you excited for the possibility of doing this all over again? You know, maybe next year if you choose to do the World Championships again, but you know, in particular Paris 2024, like this is, you know, you can only learn from this and, and, and take it for, for future races. So did you, you see what just happened to Kira's eyes right yeah. there? <laughs> She's <laughs> like Paris. <laughs> oh yeah. That, that I, so I've been to a lot of like technical meetings for marathons and for the most part, they're all like pretty straightforward and dry. Just like here are the rules. Let's follow the rules. But we went to like the team USA tech meeting. It was the most fun I've ever had in a meeting. Like the sprinters brought like an energy and just, humor to this whole thing that was like i need to be part of this more so yeah i'm gonna work my tail off to see how many more of these i can qualify for amazing well kira this has been fantastic um we've had so much fun just watching you just continue to 
just go up and up and up in, in all of your accomplishments in, in running. So we really appreciate you taking the time uh, to, to chat with us. And, and we're excited to see what the fall brings. Yeah, I'm excited too. And thank you guys for bringing this to the sport. Oh, so you can look right into that camera and say <laughs> oh, okay. anything really oh, nice okay. about it. Oh, okay. I don't even know where I was looking the whole time. But <laughs> these guys are awesome. And to bring this level of accessibility to like the athletes and the sport and the behind the scenes is so cool. And I think that you guys really elevate our sport. Like I'm doing my best like on the roads, but you guys are doing like an awesome job with the mics, like crushing it. So happy to be here. Happy to be part. Sorry I couldn't be here earlier, but uh, you guys are rocking it. Oh, thanks so much. You can invoice Kyle for that. Yeah, yeah. Raise, the yeah. <laughs> raise the roof. You guys make it very easy to to root for because you know I was joking on Twitter after the race. I hope some, this, some people didn't get the, yeah, the, the it, well, sarcasm. The, the problem is that the tweet blew up so much that I think it got out of a sphere where people knew uh. what I was talking about. I was like, it's so hard to root for Team USA's <laughs> marathoners. They're all so unlikable. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. But, but yeah. I wanted to be in that hug at the end. I think what you guys really brought, it, you know, as someone who like looks up to you guys that you've accomplished so much, especially, you know, later in your career, coming back to it, I think the most incredible thing is that you don't put any limits on yourself. And you, every single time you show up to the line with the mentality of, I think I'm going to win, I think that really We'll send is, it, right? We'll like, what, it. what have I got to lose, man? I'm going to go in and I'm going to try to win and I'll finish eighth and that's fine. But next time I'm going to go to win, maybe I'll finish third. Eventually I'm going to go in and try to win and I'm going to win it. And that's going to be a really cool day. So I'm just going to keep on, keep on bringing it. But, uh. Yeah, I didn't want that hugged in either because I was like really tired. So like they were <laughs> totally holding me up at that point. So my like knees were buckling. But um, yeah, I would be here. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, let's do this again sometime. Huh? Oh, absolutely. Maybe at your store. Yeah, that'd be fun, dude. You guys are invited anytime. We're gonna be doing a lot of different like parties and kickoffs in the next month or so. But anytime you guys are anywhere near Richmond, come on in. For your sake, wait till we sleep for a couple yeah, weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sleep this off. You. you know. Yeah. You sleep as well. Yeah, I will. I definitely will. So. Perfect. Kira, thanks so much, and and uh, Dana and David, thanks so much. We're gonna bring on yeah. Caitlin and Jasmine to help us with our next guest, here. a little swap. Here we go, boot crew. I'm staying on this couch till four o'clock. Boot crew is arriving. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, I just almost John, died trying to, to sit this? down. Just, I tell you what, I'll be here because you I did this event last night, Chris. and if you need any, any background on Iowa throwers, Qualifying standards, what they've done, personal bios. I'm, I'm right here with everything you could possibly imagine. Everything Perfect. Yes. <clears throat> so you guys grab one of these. I, uh, you would be shocked at how much. I don't think we can stop the accents now, no. Jasmine. We're a little stuck. All right. Jasmine, why don't you kick this one off and help us introduce our next guest? All right, guys. So I have my great friend, Loggy, with us. But Woo! I think something fun to do is, Loggy, can you teach everybody how to say your name? Because I think this is the biggest thing that, like, so many people are always like, we don't know how to pronounce your name. We don't know how to pronounce your name. How do you say this? And as track athletes, we kind of, like, have our names pronounced properly, right? Agreed. So, Agreed. So let's do it. <laughs> So, like I've been called like a bunch of things that like I've just gone with like Laura, Lana, <laughs> like I've been called like Leilani or just Lonnie and I'm just like whatever People okay baby. it's me. Um, I've also been called by like the places that I've been from so I've been Iowa or I've been hey Chula Vista and it's like oh thanks <laughs> love it but it's Lao Longa Tao Sanga and it's like when I tell people that I'm like you can it rhymes it's smooth it's ready to go mm -hmm. Lao Longa Tao Sanga and they're just like oh, okay. And then it's like Lu La or Lao Lu. And I'm like, the first three letters are repeated twice. <laughs> Why would you say it differently? Come on, not that hard. So, so you're talking about your name. Where'd your nickname come from? So my mom gave me that nickname. Um, and it's just like, it has no correlation with my actual name, but it just fits in so perfect. So like, it's just been a childhood nickname. Okay, also, Loggy, who are you named after? Because I feel like we've had this conversation about how she's the favorite child. Who are you named after? Um, I'm the password child. That's how you know you're the favorite. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, if 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 your mom needs to get into her computer and she's like, you know the password, it's your birthday. <laughs> yeah. Or, hey, like, it's your name. Like, yeah, that's me. And I'm, I will say it wholeheartedly. I am the favorite. Because usually it's the first child who gets that honor. I'm the fourth. Wow. There was destined to be. 
Um, my middle name is after my mom. Again, I'm the third girl. I'm I'm special. <laughs> you are and special. So my my middle name is Avel Omalo, which is my mom's name and super super long. But I'm named like like super huge Samoan name. I'm named after like someone down um, the line um, in my mother's family who's um, like a great great grandmother um, who my mom says is, like super super mean. But I'm just like I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> where that correlated with me like i could be a stern auntie but other than that like i'm i think i'm pretty okay so two-time world championship finalists how's that feel <sighs> um it feels great but also kind of saddening um basically bittersweet like you know you, you put all the work in and you have to keep reminding yourself that like it's just so hard to just make a usa team mm -hmm. like People come out the woodwork every year that you don't see the year before. Um, but then making that final and then just not performing the way you want to is pretty upsetting. But um, like I said, bittersweet. And then just overall in terms of assessing like the competition, there was a, it was, what, what, is, what has gotten into the U.S. women's throws? We came into this championship with the possibility of sweeping every single one of them. Um, I just think we have such diversity. Like our country is so huge. And so like... If if someone doesn't pick it up, another person will. So it's like we're we're always rolling deep, and I think it has to do a lot with like the, the collegiate system that we have. Um, they just spit out like amazing uh, performers every time, and so like to to have that pretty much in our back pocket is probably the reason why that we do so well on a national stage. How'd you end up finding the the discus as your event? Because it was uh, my favorite thing was like, uh, what was it? Jasmine roses are red, violets are blue, and then she had the best answer. <laughs> she had such a great answer. <laughs> um, the way that I I found discus was I so like in high school, everybody does a sport, or for the most part, um, I was forced to do sports because of my mother. <laughs> like she was like really really. I think you were the favorite. It. Exactly. I am the favorite, but like at that moment, you didn't have a say in that one. No, I didn't. Like she's like five two, and she just like dragged me by my ear, and I I'm like huge as hell, and I'm like, what are you doing? But I'm sure you're glad that she did that with I, you now. I I did, but like she was just so mean about it. She was just like, you're gonna get in there, and like she promised me it was just volleyball. She put me in volleyball. She set you up, and then I came out the season. And I was like, okay, so I'm done. And then she goes, you better go ask them what you got to do next. Ooh. They sent oh, me to basketball. Want. Me up and down that court, just <gasps> I'm just <laughs> heaving, you. just heaving. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, now I'm done. And she goes, ask them what you need. They said, you need to run track to be in shape. I said, mm -mm. <laughs> I am not going to be towing that line. Um, and I, I got forced to go to a practice and someone looked at me and was like, how about you just try the throws? And I was like, I will take anything. <laughs> Over the I will take anything. anything. You want me to jump? I jump. Look, I will. I will do anything except go out there. Um, and so, like, I ended up doing pretty well, and I, I got a scholarship. And then um, it was mostly for shot put, but mm -hmm. uh, I had like a really hard time in college with the shot. And so discus took off, and I was like, I think, I think I'm in love. I think yeah. this is this is where it needs to be. Think you found it? it? I think I found it. It may not have been there on a. Uh, on yesterday but it, it be it's there. there it'd be there it's there, there. It'd be there, it's there. <laughs> and it's so funny like because i don't you know like in black culture it's so interesting with like how parents work and like the way you just made that face like earlier it's like you better go act you gave me chills you was reminding me of my father bro like that was so crazy <laughs> Straight reminding it to families. And so I kind of want to ask you because you, you've gone on two separate extremes, right? You traveled all the way to Doha, which was a long travel, especially for Team USA. Mm -hmm. And then now you're here on your home turf. How did it feel to be here in Eugene? So I, I guess I have to look from it from a different kind of point of view as like, in 2019, like, um, I was in college. So, like, making that team was just kind of, like, 
you know, doing like a side mission after you finish the entire game. Mm-hmm. It was just like, oh wow, like this is it, because like you go all the way to NCAA. So it was, it was just like it was more like um, a vacation. So you know, I was excited. I'd never been. I was like, oh, I'm going somewhere for free ninety nine, and I did <laughs> close. <laughs> Period. Um, <laughs> and so like there was just a lot more ease to go into it. And plus, you're 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 far away from home. Here is like like you're at home, and then, so it's like. There's going to be like America is in that stadium and they're they're ready for you. And so like that that feeling just kind of creeps up on your neck and you're like, oh, my gosh, like they're 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 here for you. Um, and you just really don't want to disappoint them. Um, but it's also nice, too, because you don't have to pack as much. You know, you don't have to worry about, oh, well, they have this and this or that. I'm like, I can buy it at the store when I get here. So like. Right. So I guess like it's it's two different feelings, but um, great either way. With being here on home soil, um, I know we talked to a lot of throwers and like other field adventures this week, and they were just talking about how amazing the atmosphere was at Hayward, um, especially in comparison to every other meet that they've been to. So I just want your perspective and your opinions about how it felt, you know, being at Hayward and feeling that energy. It, it was electrifying to the point where you could either sink or swim. Um, so like you were just like oh my goodness like there's so many more people here than you've been like at a bunch of the domestic meets that we have here yeah. no one's really looking for the field events yeah. like people are just like oh well like what is that like oh what do you do like oh that's cool like they don't really know stats they don't know much like the way they right. would like a 1500 or something um and then just to have people out there um and then people like you could just hear people in the stands like even though it was so loud having someone like let's go along and i was like <laughs> it's probably Jasmine. I was like, whoa. That might have been me. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, like they're out there and like it just gave you like this this sense of like pride going in there. It's like I'm on home soil. I was like, I got my people behind me. I was like, I'm going to put everything that I can into every throw that I have. Uh so one thing I'm kind of curious about, because you you mentioned how in 2019 you were still in college and you know the world championships were much later on in the year, but it's sort of like while still being in school, you have access to all these resources, and it's now sort of as a professional doing this, you're training at the training center in Chula Vista, right? Yes. Mm. We've had this open conversation with Jasmine about how the training center is being, you know, I guess the funding is being cut. We see all these elite athletes that come away from this world championship or even the U.S. championship with spots on the team, medals. It seems like it's not that smart of a decision to stop doing this. How do you feel towards that? You can speak openly. You can curse, whatever, however you want. <laughs> Cuss it up, Locker. Hey. <laughs> I think it's going to be a decision that's going to kind of deteriorate uh, USATF. Like, that's something that worries me a lot because it's already so hard um, trying to go back to a collegiate coach because the things that the training center have offered me in the only like I've only been there one year like I I'm, I'm the skeleton crew sorry rookie I, yeah <laughs> you know so I've been able to get medical you know what I'm saying because a lot of us come from the collegiate system of being on their medical and then we're out and we're like well like you know like now we got to get our own medical or um, having some of our trips paid for it that yeah. is such a big thing um to, to be able to, to travel and have USATF be like, yeah, like, we got your back, you know? Um, and then, like, having dorms. It's San Diego. It is expensive. Come you on breathe this $2,000. You don't, like, you just want to, <laughs> like, you don't want to do nothing. And so, like, when I came in, um, they cut the dorm program, and I was like, dang. But I was one of the fortunate few who has family. Like, I'm from San Diego. Let's so, go 619. Right, you know how it be. <laughs> Come you know on. Be. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I'm living at home, but like that's not an ideal place for an athlete. You know, I have I was living with my sister and her kids. And so, like, I had children in my bed. You know, I was I was like playing the course for like single motherhood. Like, I was like, this is crazy. Like, I got to wake up at 1 a.m. and change this boy diaper. Like, <laughs> you know, I was on a, on a schedule and I was still having to be this elite athlete. Um, but I was just lucky to even have the medical and the, the the stipend to go to these meets. And so, like, now that they're closing it, it's like people are trying to rush and find spots on these collegiate teams as volunteer coaches. But what no one really understands is these coaches can only have so many volunteer coaches. 
So you have an influx of kids who don't know where they're going now. There is no real like private groups or private coaches unless you like talk about like runners, like there's running groups. There's a bunch of those. Now, now think about like throwing groups. We have like maybe like two of them yeah. who are probably not connected to a school. But then again, it's like, how many people are you going to keep pushing back into the collegiate system? Because those coaches aren't being paid to really coach those kids. Yeah. Their goal is to make sure that they win conference, that they win nationals. Right. Um, and so like you can't even take that coach with you overseas. So it's like you're, you're doing everything on your own. And it's like you don't want to be pushing kids who just came from that system um, out into the world where they don't know what they're doing. It's so hard. Like, I know that the statistics are saying, like, in those first two years of going professional, like, it will really make or break you. And yeah. there's so many people who have been like, mm -hmm. you're not making enough money. You don't have a secure place to train. Like, you may love the sport, but, like, it's time to, like, pretty much, like, grow up. Like, you have to let go of that dream. And it's pretty heartbreaking that um, that's that's happening. Josh Awatunde sat in these seats, made me look really small. Uh, <laughs> but he talked about how, you know, he picked up odd jobs, like, to support himself in, in his career, whether it was, like, a bouncer. I could see how that one worked. Yeah. Uh, and, and so for you, have you had to also balance some other side gigs? Um, fortunately, I'm in the TPP program. Okay. Um, so I was able to get some cash. But, to, you know, it's, it's still California in that it's only going to stretch so far. So I went back to my high school and I was a throws coach. Um, and then I was looking into doing a little bit of DoorDash, but then gas prices went yeah. through the roof. It went through the roof. Because yeah, Jasmine, you've done that. I was door oh dashing. And when I tell you guys, as soon as that price got over $550, it, it's not worth door dashing anymore. It, it's hard. Like, you don't want to, you don't want to do nothing. As soon as you turn that car on, I'm like, yep. Just yeah. turn it on with eighteen dollars. <laughs> I'm like, God, you don't even want to pick nobody up. You don't even want to go to work. It's like I just got to make sure this tank lasts me a week and a half. And so, yeah. like, I decided I was like, I'm not gonna do that. So I've just been, you know, just fortunate that my my mom has been able to help me because, like, you know, I'm not paying a full rent. Um, I, I have to give a shout out to her. You know, she got me in this sport and she's taking care of me now. Um, so like those odd jobs, like are hard uh, um, to do. So like, I, I'm not surprised. A bunch of people who are were at the training center say how like they had all these little odd jobs that they did to, to keep things going. And it's, it's kind of terrible that you can say you're a professional and you're not so being paid like a professional. Right. So like, yeah, like for one, that really does suck. You know, when you look at every other uh, big four sport in America, like all you need to do is show up and, and play the sport. You, yeah. Even in the NFL, like you could be sitting on the bench or make and still a making still enough make money. Yeah. Six Man. figures, and uh, literally, you don't you, you don't get hurt. You don't get you. Nothing happens to you. And so, um, just my comment on that is that that's super unfortunate. But kind of bringing it back to you know, like having odd jobs. Like I know for you, we're talking about how you're fortunate to to have a little bit more support behind you, so you don't have to stress out as much. But you know, you were just talking about like still having to pick up a job, being a throw throws coach um at a high school that was near you so what is i guess some advice that you would give to other people that do have to pick up um other jobs and things um but still want to be able to to be in this professional industry i think the one thing i would say is like we have to kind of learn a little bit more about money management mm -hmm. um for sure like you know money isn't easy to come by but like um one thing that i i told someone who was still in college i was like if you're on scholarship and you know you want to do this start putting money aside because that's going to save you when you get out and you have that oh shit moment mm -hmm. where it's like what am i doing well you have some cash where are you going to go how are you going to fund that how are you going to do things you have that in the pocket i was fortunate enough to do that i know not a lot of throwers you know we see so many people come out of like uh, smaller schools or you know, they were walk-ons and things like that who have been, been fortunate to get to this level. Mm -hmm. And they don't got that same opportunity. But, you know, like that's one of the big things I would say for people coming out the collegiate system. If you got that cash, save it. Don't save it. don't that's think really about good. buying that outfit you for Halloween. You already know. Yeah. That, that's a, yeah. We keep pulling up with Jordans right. and like Gucci hey. fits. I'm like, yeah. dang, yeah, we, can, we all can't be Fred just buying land. <laughs> <Exactly. like laughs> Bringing his barber out. Just, wow. Come on. They they did that? that? Yeah. Whoa, we yeah. didn't know that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> that's really nice. I That's wish I could do that. I mean, Shelly got her hairstylist here, so Man, we all can't nice. do must things like nice. that. It must be nice. I kind of want to ask a question because 
we've seen so many groups and just their their family orientation like the pole vultures are super close they all hang around we just talked to one of the marathoners and so hearing about how they have this friendship that they're building i was fortunate enough to go out to brazil and i think this is where me and Loggy got extremely close was going out to brazil and it was really primarily all throwers i got I'm an adopted thrower, you guys, just so you guys know. <laughs> I do the javelin. I don't throw shot. I do the jab. Um, but just to see, and then also you were, she, she's big balling out here uh, doing big things. So she was able to go out to a Diamond League meet. So unfortunately, she missed all of us kind of reuniting in Arizona for the Throws Fest, which they put in the long jump because <laughs> big throws girl here. <laughs> um, but... Can we talk about just that family feel within the throws? Because you guys are so accepting. You guys cheer each other on. Mm. You guys really do have fun at these meets together. And so I, I think everyone kind of needs to hear about it. I like it's one of the like, uh, I don't even know how to explain it. Like as soon as you see a thrower, it's it's that feeling of like, OK, like I know somebody, even if you don't, um, it's it's. I think I guess like one of the most um, like core memories that I have of like throwers being really um, accepting was I I had made my first team in 2019 and I I made the U.S. Uh, versus Europe team and I was freaking out of my mind I didn't know anybody and um, there was these two jab girls and they were just giggling up a storm <laughs> and I mean there it's Kara Winger and um, Ariana Ince. And I was just like, oh, my God. And they just like completely like enveloped me into their circle. And I was just like, oh, my goodness. Like I was freaking out. And they were just like, no, like you're you're like totally welcome into this group. Like I was following them like a lost puppy. And then like it was just it was just such an amazing feeling. And like the same thing in Brazil, like you may not know people, but by just sitting down and having one conversation, they got your back like make group chats you're, you're you're figuring things out people are helping you hey like you don't know about this grant oh sign up for this grant hey like you know what they said that there's free stuff here like let's go like it's just a a huge network of people and um they they cheer each other on you know it's like even at usa's yeah we're, we're all competing for those three spots some of us are fortunate to have four spots if someone has you know gotten auto automatic but after competition is done, everybody gets together. We talk. We we enjoy conversation. We talk. We even talk about the performances and things that have happened. Um, and there's there's no like other kind of feeling that you get from them except like being a family. And it's very very special. What's the name of the funniest group chat and who's in it? <laughs> <laughs> Does Jasmine know something that we don't? Jasmine's in the group chat. Okay. <laughs> The group yeah, chat, the group but we chat. don't even have a name for it. Okay. It's just, been left. We, just, it's just the name, and we got to put a name for we it. Got, now. We got to, we don't know yet, but it's such a good chat. It'll go dead <laughs> for a little bit, and then someone will say something, and then the phone is just ping, 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 ping. I'm like, wait, I gotta get in before it dies again. I gotta get in because it's good. It's good. <laughs> On a scale of one to ten, how out of pocket do those group chats get? Because we were oh. literally just talking to Vernon, yeah, and, a, and Marvin too. <laughs> oh, and they're like, if we showed you our messages right now, we would all be canceled. <laughs> couldn't show yeah, up I, I that, yeah. that group message. Just, Can you give you us couldn't. a number, though? Uh, from 1 to 10, I say we wake up at violence at 8. Ooh. I love it. Ooh. I love it. I yeah, love it. Violence. Yes, like, you're nobody violent. is safe in that group chat. Yes. <laughs> so, Loggy, I guess, like, an experience like this, how do you you know, take that energy, the experience and bottle it up, you know, looking ahead. I mean, we're in a crucial period right now where it's worlds, Olympics, worlds, uh, and you want to be on all those teams. Um, I think it's actually kind of exciting um, to, to have those teams back to back uh, because um, even, even though I was working towards this year, the goal was in mind for making that team next year. Um, and so it's like, it's special because without that off year, you know, people have the chance to be like, okay, I messed up, but like, guess what? We're going round two again. Right. We're going right again. Run We're going to get it again. So I think it's going to be a very special time, not just for throwers or myself, but, like, for everyone. We're going to see, like, obviously sometimes the the, the teams that people make, like, we, we see different people come up every time. Right. But this one's about to be even more rapid. We're going to see yes. people yeah. really come out of the woodwork, um, people show up that we've never seen before. Um, and, like, people shine that, you know, have struggled in the past to really make these teams. It's, it's going to be a very exciting period. 
can you give us a little bit of just your own journey for the people who are watching and may not be as familiar with you? Uh, the journey to get here, like from, from you know, where'd you go to school? How, what was the big difference to really make the leap and, and, and you know, kind of taking the just kind of leap of faith to say, I want to do this professionally? Um, so I had uh, gone to the University of Iowa and I had made a, um, I had made a team in 2019. Um, and that's when I really knew that, you know, like I could probably hang with the big girls. I went to uh, USA versus Europe and I got second place there. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I was like, I was like, this is working now. You know, I had the standard. I was like, oh, OK, then I, I um, completely different than this year. But I I like cruised through qualifying, went in there, did my thing and walked out and made it to the final like like this, like it was you know it was nothing through the shit uh, through the through shit the out of the shit out of that disc boom, 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 boom. we gotta put that on the shirt yeah hey, we got to. <laughs> but yeah like i i threw that thing and and i got into that final and even though i i, I fouled out at that meet i was just like oh no you will be seeing me again yeah. um and then you know 2020 happened with covid um but i also hurt my back really bad um and so just the struggle of coming back in 2021 um i was super inconsistent um you know, I went to the NCAA meet, uh, got second, and then I fouled out in prelims at USA uh, Trials. And there was a point, you know, where I was just like, not to be a poor sport, but I was like, do you still want to do this? You know, like you had struggled that entire year. And, you know, the more injuries you pack on, the harder it is to come back. And I was like, yeah. is this something you want to continue to do? And um, I was just really thankful that my coach at the time, um, he was leaving for Florida, but he told me, he was like, you know, um, it's okay if you don't want to follow me. He was like, but I need you to continue to keep throwing. I, you know, there's wow. something special. And so he was the one who got me in contact with um, Chula Vista. And, you know, I'm, I'm really thankful for that. And so, you know, I, I was able to take another step to get to this journey of, of having such a, such a hard time in 2021. Um, and then just like fighting through the rounds because the first part of my season this year was like, absolute trash yeah. like i wish i could go back and delete it um and then you know like i was building i like jasmine said like i had made a diamond league and then i got invited to another diamond league and i was like oh my god <laughs> okay she in here sleep, now yeah went to sleep woke up another diamond <laughs> okay. league oh another my, one another I was one like, oh my it god just kept going okay. and i was like Dang, yes. go ahead, i was like every day i wake up i'm getting new diamond <laughs> league i'm like oh yes. i'm flying is there a disc in monica uh no. Oh, that's so. Oh, I think man. I get you there. Oh, see, yes. everybody keeps talking about Monaco. Yes. Oh, it's but, yeah. amazing. They Wait. treat you real nice there too. They got caviar at the meat hotel. You can, you might oh, find wow. your sugar oh, daddy there. That. No, okay. I, I, I didn't either. I just was like, I, I'm here. I got to try it. Okay. All right. All right. Are you looking forward to any big meat in particular? Um, so because I was invited to those three Diamond League meets, I made it to the final in Zurich, which oh, is really, yes. really cool. So, Let's you know, go. you know, snap, snap, you, snap, clap, clap. So, you know, it'll, it'll pretty much be like, um, a world final again, you know, you got the yeah. top girls in there. So it's like, maybe I can go back and, and kind of redeem myself in that situation. Um, just really pleased because, you know, a lot of people like this is it world and then they got to go back into training. I still have such a long season. Um, I have the NACAC team yeah. and then. The, the final in Zurich so I'm just I'm just really excited to to kind of get over this hump that I've had right now you're talking um a lot about your journey and a lot of back-to-backs and you know we just mentioned how even if what something doesn't go right one year there's like the next five or six years of just straight championships but I think something that's important to talk about is like you know taking care of yourself during those times because um I think it was another athlete that we spoke to it's just like you know, you're training for 11 months out the year. You get like a two or three week break and then you're you're right back into it. So um, we're just curious, like, what's your plan to continue to take care of yourself physically and mentally as we go into like this amazing like championship stretch? Um, one of the things that I actually did um, was I really handled my mental health because um, I was like, this is tough. You know, you're, you're coming from a situation where you're being kind of catered to in the NCAA and then you kind of get spit out, you know? Um, so like, you know, one of the greatest things that um, happened was like USATF making sure that there were people on staff for that. So, you know, um, being able to go through like um, exercises to make sure that you are unwinding mentally because we focus so much on like, okay, like I have to go do some recovery work um, with your body, but it's like your mind 
is 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 doing so much work and you don't understand that like it needs a break it it needs a mental massage as well or it needs to put on some norma tech boots or something <laughs> yeah. um and so like that's one of the biggest things that i've done but also i'm back home now um so like i've when you're away from at school you get homesick but i'm not like i can i can go and bother my mom if i want to yeah, i can i can go tell my brother like hey like let's 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 go do this or that and so finding the actual time to figure out who you are without track and field is so important because it will consume you like you said 11 months of constant training all you know of yourself is i'm an athlete yeah. but like yeah. in those two weeks yeah it's two week break but you're like damn like do i really do anything like i kind of just throw like I don't do much and so like having to find hobbies um to make sure that your mental health is being catered to is one of the most important things what are some of those hobbies so for me I love going to the movies um <laughs> I, you know what? It's just something about sneaking snacks in to just get my yes, blood. Yes, ma'am. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Adrenaline you know. what, wait, what Ooh. snacks are you bringing in? Look, I'm bringing hot funnies and a snicker hot bar. Hot funnies is Man. crazy. Man, so good. So good. And then um, another thing I like to do is I, um, I'll just hang out with my sister's kids because – um, my sisters, uh, my sisters and brothers are a lot older than me. And so it's like having like siblings in the house. So like, I will do things like, like, I don't know, let's go play mermaids, bro. Like, I don't know. Like you guys want to go swimming? Like, let's go do it. Like I'll be that auntie. Let's, let, let's go. Give me the goggles. Let's go. <laughs> so it's like just finding that family time and, um, and that funness, um, in my hobbies has just been really great. We'll do one question each before we let you go here. Um, mine is the Josh was talking about, you know, all the throwers going out and uh, hitting Denny's. Did you hit the Denny's last night? I watched them walk out that hotel from my hotel window. Oh, wow. no. I still had to compete. And I said, damn, I want to go to Denny's. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what are we doing at Denny's? A margarita and some pancakes don't sound bad. Damn. <laughs> Jasmine can take you. Man, I was like, qualifying tomorrow must be nice, huh? <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> okay. I was I was kinda hurt. But I mean, you know what? So got a couple more that. nights. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. A couple more nights. I love you know what it. I'm saying? We'll find you in there. I, I find, got a couple find me immediately. I got, <laughs> I got a couple fun questions really quick. So if you could have a theme song to a TV show, what would your theme song be? Oh my goodness. Why would you ask me that? Come on, Loggy on spot. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Um you got a wide variety of music, too. I do. Too. I, I feel do. like we should go with the, fi figure out a song Are for Are you here. listening to music as you're warming up? Uh, I d <laughs> uh, if I tell you my music preference. Oh, God. I don't listen, think. You got to let us know. It's a no judge zone. It's a no judge zone. I zone. listen to, like, a bunch of music. So, like, I'll start off with, like, something, like, soft and, like, like nice country songs or Billie Eilish. And oh, I got to judge that. No, but listen hold on. Country. I know. No, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Hey, one, <laughs> one thing about country women, they know how to read them cowboys. They'll no, smack they them in car in. Oh yep. You know what I'm saying? Come on, Carrie. Hey, boy, boy. Carrie Underwood be doing it. Somebody hurt her. Y'all is tripping. <laughs> but then I'll move from that to like anime opening. Yes! You know oh, what I'm saying? We got another anime in the house. I'm, I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling them anime openers, I be feeling I'm telling hours. All them Naruto openers, boy, I be. Man. <laughs> and then, you know, I have, like, I listen to, like, mariachi music, too. You know, okay. okay. So, like, okay. Be, you really. This leads man. into my next question, and then we can go to Caitlin. <laughs> go ahead. Wow. But what's the, like, the final song? Is it mariachi uh, music, and then you're going? I think, I think it would have, I think, oh, my God, I'm getting nervous. Um, I think it would just have to be um, an anime opening, then. Um, from like Jujutsu Kaisen. Yes. Look at my nails. Look at my nails. You okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. 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 And then for me, my final question before we hand it over to Caitlin to ask hers. So you're taking this trip at the end of your season to Hawaii. Can I come? I need a scale. Of, so you guys, she she's dating somebody, Ooh. and I need a scale a one to ten. How mad are you going to be if he don't pull up with a ring? We not making it back on that flight. Oh! <laughs> uh, she that said it. going down she in the Pacific. She said it. They're going down <laughs> in the Pacific, yes. Why you? They're going to be, they be on calling the box talking about, did she putting the plane down? <laughs> oh, my God. We going God. down. We going down. Hey, if you don't We're see. We going down. If no. you don't see how I do that the rest of these meets because she in jail somewhere. <laughs> hey, look. Till, till death do us hard. <laughs> 
Let's do his part. Don't play with me. I ain't. I'm in love. I'm no, in no. love. She got that aggressive love. She don't fuck with love. I love it. I will throw a discus at his neck. Please, guys. Oh, don't do this. Shoot. Oh, shoot. Loggy. Oh, oh, how, uh, how do you close this out after that? Like? Oh, I don't even know how to close this. I was going to go back to anime, but damn. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, one quick question before I get into the final one. But do you watch um, One Piece as well? If you tell me, no, I'm going to cry. I say no. There's too many episodes. Dang, Same bro. thing with Naruto. Can... All right, all right, all right. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. All right. No, ma'am. So, question, question. You watch? Do you watch Dragon Ball Z at least? No, ma'am. Oh my god! I can't even ask you to match up. Do you watch Attack on Titan? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. All right. Now we now yes, we can get somewhere with this. Who do you believe in your training group could survive the rumbling? Oh, and your training group? Ah. Uh, mm. We all Titans in there. Ain't nobody oh, survive. We ain't we no man. Like, 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 all, right, all right, if y'all all Titans, what Titan will you be? And Damn. you can't say the female Titan, cause that's true. That's true. And I would have to say the Colossal. I'm big as hell. Yeah, for I'll sure. I be in there swiping sure. thing. Whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> Whoosh. They gonna be wiping out the hey, whole wiping city, everybody. Bro. <laughs> oh, oh, this your farm. <laughs> You I'm mess that boy. I'll be a I menace. Mean, I'll be a menace in there. I can't even say that you're not a menace because after you talking about putting the plane down in the water, if you don't come on with a ring, I don't know about that. We talk about that about once a week, y'all. Man, in that group chat. In that group chat. <laughs> oh man. Hey, don't leave hints if you're not gonna. You ain't gonna go through with it. Oh, we'll, we'll make sure to clip this and tweet it out. Oh so yeah. Just so he make, knows. make sure you let him know. Yeah. Okay. Is it, what's what's know. his Twitter handle? He don't got one. Okay. Yeah. Instagram. Yeah. Uh yeah, I can get that to you. All right, oh, cool. I can get that to you. She Perfect. We'll make sure to tag him. To sure to everybody. Everybody. Let him know. <laughs> <laughs> Let him know. So for our, our our followers, if we post the clip, everyone in the comment section will have to tag him in the comments. Yes. Yes. To make yes. sure that he gets and sees this reel of Loggy, making sure he knows what to expect on vacation. So, uh, Loggy, thank you so much for doing this. This was a blast. Uh, and. You know, hope hopefully next next year in Budapest you've got some some uh, some, some jewelry. Hardware, on you. man. Finger Let's filling pray heavy. About it. Let's yeah. pray about it. All right, <laughs> Loggy, thank you, Jasmine, Caitlin, thank you so much. And now we're going to bring on uh, John Anderson, Kyle Merber, and our uh, next guest who maybe brought uh, some jewelry of his own. I did, I did your event last night for World Athletics. Mm -hmm. I just called you Betty. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, all the international commentators are like, how do you say her name? And I said, I just call her Betty. And that guy, and then she's, <clears throat> Betty. Yeah, I just call her Betty. All right. That was electric. That was amazing. That was, I, by the way, you got run over, right? You know that, oh, right? Oh, that was like, amazing. You were just, oh, you Trevor! Were, you were just oh, set God. decoration. All That's right. all you were, was Yo, set no. decoration for that piece. That yeah. was amazing. Here we go. It is, our next guest is the world championship bronze medalist in the 400 meter hurdles. One of the best stories in track and field all season. The man who doesn't get out of bed for more than $5, so I've got $10 <laughs> right here to hand it. <laughs> Appreciate that. Trevor that for an intro, Matt? Bassett, welcome <laughs> to the show. We have just, uh, I woke up excited for this one. How, how are you feeling? I feel good, especially since I just got $10. So <laughs> yeah. I feel really good about that. By the way, 16 months ago, that would have been a violation. The poor kid would have lost his eligibility. Hey, now, now we're pro golden. everything. Perfect. They didn't give you any prize money for that medal? Uh, not for a while. I won't. I won't see that for a little bit. But we'll get. It'll. It'll get there. Right, Tend to hold you what, over. Are we, what, was, what are they paying? I don't even know. What's the prices? It's, 50? 40? Oh, I wish. Uh, first, first gets 70. Second gets 35. Third gets 22. Okay. Right. 22 is a weird number. It, I also Honestly, thought just so. 20. <laughs> or round no, 25. No, we'll, stay, we'll stick with 20. Either keep it at 22 round or the 25. Either or. We don't need to right. drop the number. <laughs> So that race, how many times have you watched it now? Honestly, one time. Really? I watched it with my family at their Airbnb after, mainly because I just wanted to hear like the commentary and everything, kind of see the broadcast, mm -hmm. like the show of it. I really only watched that one time. I'll probably go back and watch it more, but I kind of just watched it the one time. We saw you in the mix zone, I, and I spoke to you, and I... The question that he asked you at USA's, and it goes back to your original lap count interview in the winter, was, would you tell Hurdle 8 
And that's really honestly where the big move was was made. Because if if people picked it up for the final hundred meters, you were sitting in what what place? It was like I was in six. Yeah, six. So you place. closed hard. We need a right. shirt. Six something about, about hurdle eight. Right. You and, and six hurdle pays eight. like thirteen hundred dollars. So, so you, you were thinking money. Six is not twenty two. <laughs> yeah, not twenty. It's an even stranger number. It's <laughs> yeah, not, it's an odd more, number. More more abstract. There might be cents in there at that point. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, so the good news is I've I've been talking to her weight less and less because I've been getting so much more comfortable and better with it. For people that don't know the background, hurdle weight was always kind of my issue. I would stutter going into it because this hurdle spacing was weird. With the other hurdles, I felt like I'd hit one. So it had just been weird. I'd like have to mentally tell myself a cue to go into it. But at this point, things have been going so well, knock on wood, that mm. Uh, I just haven't really had to think about it that much. I was kind of just running through it. So hurdle eight's in the past now. I don't worry about that. It's just Ooh, like all the other that's hurdles. Your X? Yeah, it's <laughs> just like all the other all, all the other hurdles. I'm still through. <laughs> I'm still through with hurdle eight. That's the last one off the curve, right? Yeah. And then we got two as we and go. And then through. nine, ten. Nine and ten. By the way, you were way out there too to run this race. Yeah, I don't know how I got lane eight. The lane assignments have been kind of weird. It seems like for the finals and. I thought with me, like, I got a big Q, big Q energy with second in my heat. And fourth fast time overall, I was like, oh, I'll probably be in, like, seven or three, maybe I think six four. is the preferred lane in that track. I think they're giving, yeah, I think it's six because it's a nine-lane track. But I saw the lane draw was eight, and I was like, shit, okay. <laughs> it's like, like Rai said, like, we had literally talked about it. I'm like, I'm in lane eight, he's in lane three. Like, it's, we just got to send it. It's going to got to be a full send. So Rai in the mix zone like in addition he was happy with his silver medal which was great to see because like last year we obviously know how down he was after the tokyo olympics because he did everything he could got under the previous world record and came away with the silver and this time he was so thrilled and i think a big part of it and what he spoke about was the fact that he comes into these championships most times and he's mr solo dolo focused on him by himself you know gets into the right headspace something about the friendship that you two have struck in the past week really you know led him to say hey do you want to do blocks together and you guys did that and we saw it in the tackle afterwards where he just <laughs> hits it drills you to the ground and he was so amped for you can you take us through i guess like the past week and and this friendship that has blossomed because it's you know the buddy cop movie that we want to <laughs> see made yeah it's funny because for me everything's really coming full circle for me I remember, was it 2019, his last year at USC? When, yes. Yeah, so when he went for, I remember sitting in my living room with my parents. I had just ran 51-3 to win the D2 championships. He then, I watched him go 47-02, and I was like, wow, this dude's insane. And then, like he, like I said in multiple interviews, he's the standard for American 400 hurdling. So I've always kind of looked up to him and, like, trying to get to that level and like I, we'd cross paths at USA's, like maybe talk some things here and there. And it's funny, I didn't know Ryan knew who I was. It was <laughs> we're at the USA Championships. It was one of the practice days. I'm waiting for my parents to pick me up by the exit. Ryan and Michael Norman are there with like their group. This is back in June. This is back in June at USA's. And this kid walks up. He he like talks to Ryan, talks to Michael Norman, and he comes walk, walk up and he was like, oh, he's gonna like ask me for like a picture or something. He goes hands me his phone he goes hey can you take a picture of us <laughs> with with so i'm like i'm like yeah no problem so i grab his phone like mid picture rye goes you don't want a picture of trevor bassett and i was like oh shoot he knows who i am oh. but you then have done the selfie like turned around oh yeah right. sure just totally tried it. to play it off but yeah so that kid that was a humbling moment for me going into the usa championships but then yeah like i was out at the practice track here uh ryan michael showed up i had blocks that day like i was getting hurdle set up and yeah, Rob's like, hey, like, are you doing starts? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, you want to do starts with me? And I was like, yeah, like, you're right, you're right, Benjamin. I'm not going to turn that down. And yeah, it's kind of from there. He, then he kind of learned my story a bit from there because his coach asked, like, oh, like, where's your coach at? And I was like, I'm right here. But, and then, yeah, and then I kind of went out of my way a lot more to kind of try to talk to him and be, pick up stuff from him, just kind of be around, like he said. He said, I have good energy. Rai has great en energy. He's a great dude. I can't say enough nice things about the guy. So <clears throat> you mentioned the being self-coached uh, aspect of, of your training. 
Kyle on the podcast uh, a couple nights ago was recounting just exactly why your story is so amazing this year. It was you were holding back tears a little bit. I mean, emotional. it's special. I, 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 it's funny. A lot of people have asked what the, like the best moment so far is, and your Joe Kovacs in the jacket. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely the funniest. Oh um, but for me, you know, it wasn't a gold medal. It was your bronze medal. Was the thing that for me was the most emotional because. I was familiar with your story, and I'd allow you to tell the story um, rather than me do it because it, it is yours. But for myself and maybe anyone who is previously familiar with it, I know mm -hmm. if, maybe if you didn't even know the story, it's just like, hey, who's this guy? Uh, you know, that's not Rye Benjamin getting a medal. That's another American, too. Like, that's cool in and of itself. But then being aware of everything that you had dealt with in the past year, that highlight of the championships and i can't imagine something topping it yeah so kind of what had happened was uh so i get going to the u.s olympic trial seated third overall with a 4880 which is insane to think about 4880 being third at the u.s now with how mm -hmm. this event's taken off but i end up placing eighth uh i was very detrained going into the meet i hadn't been able to run for a month because of an ankle injury in both ankles and then I'm watching the Tokyo Olympics at my house, watching, I forced myself to watch the 400 hurdles because like, I, I know it's gonna hurt, but like, I need to watch it. And obviously Ryan Carson run their times, right? 45, <laughs> nine, 46, one, Allison 46, seven. And I will, there was a three day stretch where I was like, should I like think about switching to the open 400 or the 200? But I was like, no, like just stay with it. And I was having a text conversation with my head coach, Judd Logan, and we were talking about the race. And I just said, I was like, yeah, like, I guess I got to step my game up. The world record's now three seconds faster than my lifetime best. And then he goes, and then people have seen the post because I posted it of him saying, you'll be in the final at World Championships in Hayward. Like, I believe that. Hashtag get that lane. And then he sends in classic Judd fashion, he goes, He's like, I'll screenshot this so when it happens, it'll I'll put it out. It'll make for a good tweet. And Judd ended up passing away in January from COVID-related pneumonia. He was diagnosed with leukemia in 2019 and beat it, like destroyed it. You would have never known. Seeing him, talking to him, he just brought the same energy any day, every day. And so he passed away in January. In September, my longtime coach, Coach Clark, he called me into his office. He was very emotional, and he said, hey, I'm leaving. Like, the better opportunity for my family, we're going out to San Jose State. So no hard feelings. I'm still very close with him. We talk all the time. In fact, he helped me with my training for, for Worlds, between USAs and Worlds. So he leaves, so I'm kind of left, especially once January hit. The two staples of Ashland that were the main reasons I chose Ashland were gone. And it was kind of trying to adjust from that. It forced me and my fellow fifth-year teammates to really kind of step up and be that steady hand for people. And then I make the indoor world team. And I'm on a 10-hour flight from Aust Austria back home after the meet. I land in New Jersey, take my phone off airplane mode, phone blows up. And the sprint coach we had brought in was then, they went separate ways. Him and the school went separate ways. And they, our coaches told the team that they asked who the hurdle coach was going to be. And they're like, oh, we'll, we'll ask Trevor when he gets back. And I had heard nothing <laughs> about it until I got back. And then I was like, yeah, like, okay. I've, I've always kind of viewed myself as a student of my event. I've saved workouts. And I have every workout I've done in college written down on my laptop. So I kind of went back, pieced things together, consulted with my old coach on making sure I made the program, sent it to him, be like, hey, make sure I'm not going to like kill anybody doing this. Sent him the hurdle workouts for the team. Good to go. Wrote the hurdle workouts for the team. Then I wrote my training from the end of D2 Nationals, which is the last week of May, to USA's. Went through there, which that was a really tough time mentally of being like, because I hadn't PR'd yet. Like going into the USA Championships, my personal best was still 4880 from a year before. And training by yourself, there's not a coach there. My fiance comes out every now and then. I have teammates out there every now and then. It's really hot out. Training for the 400 hurdles is not a very, it's not for the faint of heart. So I was really struggling mentally going into that. 
we have the big breakthrough. Each round, I just felt better and better at USA's. 47-4, make the team. And then I texted my coach again. I said, hey, like, I, you need to write my training because I can write a taper for myself, but I can't write, like, rebuilding up and, like, continuing a taper. Like, I can't do that yet. And he was more than happy to help. I was in constant communication with him, texting him every day. My fiance would come out on hurdle days to record so I can look at videos, make sure hurdle splits are where I want to be, have teammates coming up every on certain workout days, splitting reps. I thought I killed my friend Channing one day with a 300, 200. He was laying under a bench for a good 15 minutes, but he survived. And I did, I did tell my teammates, I said, if you guys come out and train with me, I will buy you dinner. I will get, it's not going to be a fancy dinner. <laughs> we got an Applebee's in Ashland. I'll get you something there. D2 but after 10 o'clock when appetizers are yeah, off. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, yeah, that, I feel like that pretty much sums up the story a little bit. And but I feel like Dr. Evil. Pretty standard stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know. <laughs> well, I, I just, you know, for those who maybe aren't familiar with Judd's story, like, you know, an unbelievable athlete in his own Oh, my right. gosh. Four-time Olympian in the Four hammer Four-time Olympian, in, <laughs> which you don't see a lot, especially in the throwing events. Four-time Olympian. Um, he would have made a fifth Olympic team, but on his first throw at the trials, he tore every ligament in both elbows. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he was never able to straighten his arms fully, so he always walked around just kind of like that because he could not fully straighten his arms. But so four time Olympian, he, there are so many Judd stories about like just him as an athlete doing ridiculous things that I could literally do a podcast on it for a month. And. <laughs> And then also, uh, Ashland, he was the staple, like 50-something NCAA championships. Is that Yeah, correct? oh, I couldn't. The amount of national champions and All-Americans he had there, coach there for 20, 27 years total, mm -hmm. I think 25 as the head coach. And, I mean, we won three team titles back to back to back. And at a D2 school where our indoor facility, up until this past year, was a 147 meter bank track built in the 60s. Four lanes. Boards? Yep. Wooden boards. You run, and you just hear boom, 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 boom of the boards. Super sketchy. When you're going around the one turn where they throw a hammer into the net, you kind of got to look and make sure. Because then also off to the side in the wall, there's like five holes from where a hammer <laughs> slipped out of someone's hand and went through the wall. Very, very not safe, but. It produced a lot of national champions. So you're in sixth place with a hundred meters to go, less yeah. than a hundred meters to go. Yeah. You basically dive at the finish line. <laughs> On TV, I don't even know if you realize that your name was fourth initially. I, I did end up seeing that mine was fourth initially. In the stadium, we it was a long wait before we knew. Fifteen seconds to be exact. And like you know, I <laughs> the <laughs> longest fifteen seconds the of your longest, life. Counting. Longest of my life. And you know. It 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 just is it's such a perfect story. Like the was it his birthday just Yes. The was it on day, that day? The finals day was his birthday. I mean, it, it's the, all of these things coming together is why it's so special. And yeah. What's the outpouring been like since? It's been I mean, my phone's still I'm pretty much bringing a portable charger with me everywhere cuz <laughs> by the time I open and close a social media page, I have more notifications. It's been unbelievable, and I'm really happy, and I was touched by the tribute NBC did with me in the ch in the call room. They put up a graphic and everything. They told the story, and I really appreciate that because it meant a lot to me and so many people that Judd had touched. And I mean, one of my favorite things to say now is that Judd was not much of a runner in his day as a hammer thrower, but he, he runs those races with me. And I mean... I did go back and look at the race from my fiance angle because she records the race, then records the board. They put up rise time, and from the time between rise mine is 15 seconds, which thinking about how instantly results pop up is a really long time. And I also didn't blink when the time <laughs> when the time when rise time popped up. I was staring at the board. I was like, I don't want to blink because I don't want to miss it. Did you think you had it? I did. I th I thought I had it, but then as 15. 15 seconds is a long time to just be in your own thoughts. And I was like, oh, it's Indoor Worlds all over again, where I lost, missed out on a world title by .05. And then I was like, no, but I think I got him. I think I got him. And my time popped up, and I just I shot both arms up in the air, 
<laughs> and I turned to go to the cameras because I had it planned. Fred Curley took the silencer. So I did the silencer after USA's. Fred Curley did it after he won. So I was like, that's gone. I cannot do that, especially if I don't win. I can't do the silencer. Like That was such a great moment. Like I can't top that. So I turned to the cameras. I'm like, oh, my teammate Channing gave me the idea. Do the Steph Curry. Right. The sleep because everyone's sleeping on you. I was like, perfect. So I turn to the cameras. I do an arms cross. And as I'm going into it, just get trucked by Rye Benjamin. How much did that hurt? Not at all. It was, I think because, you know how quarterbacks say when they get hit from the blind side, it doesn't hurt that bad because they're so like loose and relaxed. They weren't expecting it. Sure. I feel like I relate to that now. Okay. So any NFL college football quarterback, I got you. I know. You're I know right. what it feels like. So I have, can I have two questions real quick? First yeah. off, uh, of all this outpouring, the most unique or uh, the person that you've heard from that you went, wow, that person found my number and, and sent me a congratulations. Ooh, that's a good one. Because I also feel bad because especially on social media, there's been a lot of messages that I've missed just mm -hmm. because, I mean, there was so many. Most of the text messages I got from people I had already known because okay. my phone number doesn't get out there too much, thankfully. <laughs> but I think just the outpouring from mainly like the Ashland alumni of like the Ashland track and field or people that really knew mm -hmm. Judd, like Ashley Kovacs. Reach, I talked to her a bit in the weight room when I first got here. And then, like, a, she's been very great with the mm -hmm. with the responding to everything, the outpouring, everything. And it's that's that's probably the one is Ashley's been really great about it. And then the follow-up question, because I'm going to beat Kyle to it, is uh, how exactly did you find these messages on your phone when the phone seemed to be MIA? <laughs> Let's hear about the celebration <laughs> post-race, <laughs> Travis. Yeah, <'cause> so... <laughs> a little less traditional than going to Denny's. Yeah, I... I wish I would have gone to Denny's, but so everybody does now, right? Yeah, like Denny's, Denny's is the spot. No free shout outs, Denny's. Um, <laughs> IHOP also great. Oh yeah, I got I got IHOP the other day. <laughs> IHOP. <laughs> um, but no, so you're not allowed to have your phone when any electronics when you go into the call room, and I forgot my phone was in my bag, so I was like, oh, I grab it. Rye hands it to his coach. I see Daniel Roberts. I was like, oh, like D Rob and I know each other. Like we're good, we're friends, whatever. So I take out my phone. I'm like, hey, D-Rob, can you hang on to my phone for my race? And he's like, oh, yeah. I was like, if you leave, because he was in the med tent. I'm like, if you leave the med tent, just like put it on one of the tables. He's like, yeah, I got you. <laughs> so finish the race, go through media, and then we're just sitting in this area waiting for the press conference. And Rye gets his phone from his person. And one of the Team USA people come by. I'm like, hey, can you go get my phone? They're like, yeah, who has it? I'm like, Daniel Roberts. He leaves. Comes back five minutes later, he goes, D-Rob says he doesn't have it. I'm like, oh, that's fine. I'm like, I told him just leave it in the med tent. So it's probably on like on like one of the coolers on the side. He was like, all right, cool. Goes out there, comes back. He's like, it's not in the med tent. I'm like, what do you mean? It's not in the med tent. <laughs> and Daniel this, wouldn't do that to you. And at no. this, yeah, at this <laughs> point, I'm like, I'm like, dude, I know my phone's on. Like, I want to text like my family. Like, I have some time before I go to the press. And I was like, I, want, I really want my phone right now. And they're like, we'll, we'll work on it. We'll get it back to you after the press conference. I'm like, okay, cool. So I finished the press conference. He's the first person I see when I walk out the door is the Team USA guy, Chris. And I'm like, you got my phone? He's like, no luck. So I'm like, okay. Um, well, I'm going to go to drug testing. This will be a little bit. So he's, I was like, did Dan say put it somewhere? He's like, he said he put it on the massage table. I'm like, okay, go check there. Check on the ground around. Maybe it was in a bag. He's like, yep, I'll do that. Get out of drug testing. I'm like, you find my phone? He's like, no. I'm like, all right, let me go look. We walk out of the building. I'm like, oh, it's dark out now. Because last time I was outside, it wasn't dark. <laughs> and so we go to the tent. They're like, oh, hey, the team tent's like tied up. So I then roll underneath the tent to get in there. I'm like, can I borrow your phone so I can use the flashlight? So I'm using the flashlight, shining around. And he goes, oh, I'll call. I'm like, great idea. Phone's on do not disturb. Because I put on do not disturb when I warm up because I don't want my music getting interrupted. And... So I'm like, okay. So we keep looking for it, can't find it. And my agent, Karen, bless her soul, she's like, hey, we'll take you to your fiance. She has an iPhone. She used find my iPhone. I'm like, perfect. She's like, it's probably back at the team hotel. Honestly, Jeez. I'm like, it's probably in Daniel's bag. So we leave the track, drive to my family's Airbnb. I get in the car. I'm like, so where's my where's my phone? She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you said you tracked. She's like, yeah, I don't have it. I'm like, obviously you don't have it, but where is it? She's like, oh, it's in the stadium. 
This is hours after you finish. It's 11.30 at this point. It is 11.30 at night. Have you had a single beer or anything? No. Nothing. You haven't celebrated one bit. Terribly dehydrated. <laughs> <laughs> so, haven't, haven't celebrated at all. Because the second I got out of drug testing and would have, I'm like, I need my phone. So, we drive back to the stadium. We get as close as we can with, like, roads being blocked off. So, me and my fiance are jogging in there. There's, like, security guys are like, hey, hey, hey. I hold my credentials. I'm like, I'm an athlete. Left my phone. I'm still in my jersey. <laughs> I'm in my jersey with my bib on. I'm like, I left my phone. It's in there. Like, okay, go ahead. So I go in there. We get to the warm up area. I'm like, where does it say it is? She's like, it's over here. And it looks like it's in the med tent. So I go into the med tent. I walk up to her. I'm like, it says it's right here. And then the phone refreshes and like bounced. (laughs) I'm like, okay, so now I moved. And then I tried to ping it. I didn't have it saved as a device on our phone, so you can't ping it. Because I feel like back in back in the day, when I was in, <laughs> like when I was in, years ago, yeah, like five years ago when I was in high school, you could just ping your phone from anyone. It's like it wasn't a hard thing to do. So I then get out from, I roll out from the tent. I'm like, I can't believe you're just navigating around <laughs> in, at 11:30 at night. <laughs> and and honestly, I, this is answering a lot of questions I had about the whole legend head oh, yeah, situation. The mascot head getting stolen. I heard about yeah, that. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, it's like what? But the, it doesn't so seem I'm, like it's impossible. I'm just navigating. <laughs> This turf field outside of Hayward where like all the team med tents are. And I'm like, it says it's in the call room. I'm like, there's no way. Like they wouldn't let you in the car unless you had to race. So I'm in the call room. I'm like turning over chairs, like looking around corners. There was a printer box I looked inside. I was like, there's no way. But I'm like, maybe. So, and it's not in there. So I'm like, okay. It says it's in this, the World Athletics med tent. So I'm like, let me go in here. It I go says in there. Specifically, it's in well, the world. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The sign, it says, check this tent. So I go in there, and it's, it's not in there. So I'm like, it says it's like over here. So I get out from the tent. I'm like, looking around. I at this point, I get informed that Oregon doesn't have sales tax. I'm like, okay, I can just go buy an iPhone tomorrow. You do have twenty two thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I got a little We're payday. <laughs> got, a little, got a little payday coming in. But so I then. I'm like, it says it's like right in between the tents. But I'm like, there's no way. Because just between the tents, there's like two chairs, a TV, and like an AC unit. So like, I'm like, I'm just so I'm like, I'm just going to walk over here. So I walk over there and I look and I look down and sitting on the chair, face up, screen up, out in the open is my phone. With text. <laughs> and I'm like, so I say, I get back to this. I get back to the team hotel the following morning, and they're like, I was like, I told them where I found it, and they're like, oh, yeah. And they're like, Daniel was watching the race on that TV, and he must just, like, set the phone down there and forgot about it. I'm like, oh, he must have. <laughs> <laughs> he must have. <laughs> so by the time I ran, the race went at 7.50. By the time we, get, we did the victory lap, got through media, drug testing, it was probably about 10. By the time I get to my phone and take it off, do not disturb, it is... Like eleven forty-five. Wow. And <laughs> unread texts. I was at I want to say seventy-five roughly, and then the Instagram. my Instagram and Twitter. Oh. It just my it just said like twenty-five plus. <laughs> I had Facebook notifications off, thankfully, and I mean there were so like it got to the point in the night where like I was going to just like liking the message like like. I'm like, I can't respond to all of these. Copy so, paste. Yeah. <laughs> so to people that sent me like a heartfelt message on social media, I just responded with a heart. I'm sorry, but there was a lot going on. <laughs> so how did you sleep after all of that? Marvin didn't sleep after his 100 medal. Oh, I believe it. Um, I mean, I got I got about two hours. <laughs> By the time I got to my room, I did feel tired, but I laid in my bed because I got to my room at like 3 a.m., Rolled around, tossed and turned for a while. I looked at my phone, like, wide awake. And I was like, it's 6 a.m. I was like, all right, I guess I'm getting up at 6 a.m. <laughs> and I just sat on my phone on social media till about, like, 7.30 when Trey got up. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to shower and then go downstairs. So, so my question now is, after two hours of sleep, are we... It- are you maybe on the four by four, or are we done? Are you allowed to tell us? Because I so here's here's what I'll say. You were second indoors at the world at championships. World, I feel like I feel like I can run a little bit, but so what if we I, just did a hurdle only four by four? Like we throw you, Grant, now Rye, now here's please. the question: hurdle only mixed four by four. Me, Rye, Delilah, Sydney. <laughs> 
<laughs> Disgusting. World record. <laughs> well, oh, easily. And that won't get touched. But <laughs> so what I would say is I told the relay coach the first the first day I got here, the 11th, I happened to be on the relay coach with the – or I had to be with the relay coach in the elevator. And I was like – we were just sitting there. It was kind of quiet. I was like, need a 4 by 4 guy. Let me know. And he's like, okay. <laughs> so they, they know I'm interested. I've – Never turned down a four by four before, and I don't plan on it. If they need me, these legs are ready to go. If not, I get it. So I'm kind of, kind of. My flight leaves the 23rd at like one. Mm-hmm. They better so tell you soon. They need to let me know soon so we can get some flights moved right. around. But I wouldn't. I'd love to be on the four by four. Okay, how about we give you? You give me that mixed four by four. Go against the rule, but you have the hurdles. You probably still win. I mean, yeah. If we and that would be close. <laughs> you think so? Oh, yeah. actually, uh, I don't know. Because I mean, you want to take a, bring on the Dominicans and let's go. I think. I mean, I don't know I because really I don't think that math drama. adds up. I don't know because I, I mean, I want to see it. I like, think let's be, say, the drama would be great. Like, I mean, let's say like all four of us have hurdles. Yeah, you guys got to run the hurdles. Every other country in the lane, no hurdles. You have a forty-four life. point in you in the four hundred <laughs> hurdles. <laughs> if I if I did if I did this medal would be shinier. I'm telling you, and the payday happen. would be bigger. I, I want to see you guys. I feel like you take, you still take top three. I think if you give two of us hurdles, maybe. Can we see the medal? Yeah. Let me move. Let me move the ten dollars. Oh. <laughs> the 20, spot right Twenty-two thousand and ten dollars. Twenty-two thousand and ten dollars. Where are you gonna put this? Wow. I'm gonna put this around my neck at some point. Yeah. yeah. Throw it on. Throw it on. Throw it on. Throw it on. Now, did you dig the new way they do that, where you get the medal right away oh, and then you awesome. got to give it back? You're in on that. Um, I didn't. I be honest, I didn't love giving it back. Right. But oh, you do give that one back. That's yeah, because then they have to the do. Metal. They got. They got to do the engraving on it the is back. The metal. No, no, that's the same one. It's the same uh, one. And but they take it from you while you go do some stuff. Yeah. So you do the victory lap. You do some media with it, and then you know how they give us the chips and our bibs. When they take the chips back, they take the metal also. Which I was like, dang, like, really? Do they I have someone right engraving? Sure they spelled your name right. I hundred percent. That was the first thing I checked. The amount of times my name is spelled. Been spelled B A S S I T or E T T or one S. Like, there's kind of three potential places to screw up the spelling of your <laughs> yeah. last name. The S's, the, the E-R-I, S's, the, and the two I-R-E T's. and the T's. Yeah, yeah. that's that's tough. I'm well, put that right there for safekeeping. I'm sure, you don't want to. <laughs> what uh, was behind the sunglasses at the press conference? You know, so I'm gonna shout out to Rye. It was his idea. <laughs> we were literally getting ready to walk in the press conference. Rye goes. Can we wear like glasses for these? They're like, yeah. And he just like looked at me and I was like, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Granted, I mean, I only got asked one question, which is fine, but yeah. Well, and just, and we I did just, an emergency pod. We left the stadium because we were just so amped just up. Amped. Mac and I immediately sprinted back. We were live here talking about it within 10 yeah. minutes of, you know, the race finishing. Right. Yeah. So the sunglasses and, and I was just like, it's just a cool thing to do, you know? <laughs> like, they got they got the picture of Marvin in the call room with the sunglasses on. Yeah. I asked you in the mix zone about the Domino's games, and <laughs> can you, I guess, like, for the people watching this time around, explain a little bit more about just, I mean, were they taking your money? Like, or, Oh, no, 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 okay. no. I, I, know, I know better than to make sure I know 100% what game I'm playing before I put money on it. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, I was just hanging out in the lobby, and they were looking for something. They're like, like Trevor, you know how to play dominoes? I was like, yeah, I know how to play dominoes. Because me and some of my teammates, we played dominoes in the team hotel at Nationals. So I was like, oh, sweet, I got this. So we're, play- we're playing dominoes, and it's going pretty standard. Like, I feel like I know what I'm doing. Then at one point, Marvin goes, wait, wait, wait. I'm like, what? He's like, I'm going to tell you this one time. He's like, count your score. I was like, what do you mean score? <laughs> Because the way we played, it was just kind of like you add, you line up with it's the same number you line up until you run out of dominoes. And so I was like, I was like, score. He's like, you have ten points right here. I go, how? <laughs> and they kind of started laughing. I was like, how? They're like, they're like, count it. I was like, they're dominoes. Do I count all the dominoes? They're like, they're like the edges. So then I kind of started to figure it out. And then I they started tricking me, because I started to figure out that every time they looked at me, I would score. Then at some points, it was mainly Vernon. Vernon would look at me, and he'd be like, you score there? And I was like, no. He's like, he's like, all right, just checking. Just checking. Wait, so who's in this game? Me, 
Marvin Bracey, Vernon Norwood, and Fred Curley. I right. love the, the and response the, tweet. Someone said, I don't know what's going on here, but these are some 1950s yeah, names. That was, <laughs> Marvin that, and Fred. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was my buddy Connor from my high school. Um, <laughs> it's funny, too, because when he said it, you look at it, and you're like, yeah, those are those are 1952 <laughs> names. And Marvin. And then the amount of the amount of times Fred goes, that's 20. I'm like, no, it's not. And he's like, you sure? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, okay. I will say, by the end of the game, I get it. I, they say I don't know how to play. I know how to play. So they, I, they say I'm retired though. I think <laughs> I, I'm saying I think it's because they're scared. So I saw Fred after the press conference, the first one that they did with all the U.S. athletes, and I was out there talking with. Coach Francique when he rolled in, and I said, "What's up with uh, the Dominoes and and Trevor?" I said, "It seems like maybe you're you're being mean." <laughs> no, he just don't know how to play. And I said, "Well, did you teach him?" No. <laughs> I said, "Did you take him for money?" Man, that didn't even be fair. We don't pay for money, but he'd be. Well, you'd have been twenty two thousand. Yeah, they, <laughs> basically, is what he was saying. Is yeah. That, at some point, they're like, "We we were hard on him." But we were merciful because at oh, no point did we take his cash because we nice. could have absolutely yeah, definitely. sent they, him out buck naked into the world with nothing left. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like <laughs> it wasn't like they were hard. They were harsh, hard. I mean, it wasn't. It was just stuff. It was, yeah, it was the but boys. they didn't take your money, so that was didn't cool. take said, didn't yeah, take my did money. Not, they did not. He, like they realized at some point this is a mercy. We can't do that. I will say though, I am undefeated in Madden at the Team USA Hotel, okay. and he's busy, but. Arian Knighton has been ducking me all week in Madden. <laughs> oh, wow. He's been ducking me all week. I think maybe after tonight he'll be ready. We'll see. Who do you play as? Tighten up. I'm a Titans fan. Die okay. hard. I'll play with anybody, though. Okay. <laughs> anybody. Tighten up. Is there a gamer tag out there you float out to see if you've got fans out there who want to play with you? I'm not, I'm not putting that out there. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so th this year it sounds like you spend a lot of time you know, training yourself, your fiance, yeah. huge help. Do you know what you're doing now? Like, what are you gonna? Did you like that? You know, coaching yourself in many no. ways, or <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know what I'm doing next. Um, I have, I know I have options out there. Once I kind of get back from this trip, I'm gonna take like a week off, really, just kind of like be back home, be with my family, stuff like that. Done with the season. Yeah, I'm shutting down after this. Cool. Uh, 40, 40 plus races is enough. For me <laughs> so i don't know what other people's race count was in that 400 hurdle final but i was saying that i think if you added them all up add up all the other seven guys i think i still might have them beat that i mean carson came carson in with, with three three if you count the prelims if you count, if you count each rounds, which i do i mean it's 400 hurdle races on that's tough on your legs so carson with three i think rye had six or seven mm -hmm. i don't know about anybody else but i feel like it'd be close so, yeah, I mean, I, no Diamond Leagues. I'm, uh, I'm curious. The only Diamond League meet left that has the 400 hurdles before the final is Poland, which is up. I think the Poland meets like August 6th. And I, I was open to doing that. But then kind of after talking about it with my agent, we're like, there's not really like too much of a point. Like, obviously, there's prize money getting a Diamond League experience and all that. But I'm tired. Yeah, I'm tired. I'm tired. <laughs> Uh, Ashlyn, right? You're winning all these things, D2, right? You're, you're, you're a wrecking crew. Yeah. Tell me about how it is we, you go from, oh, wow, that's right, Benjamin. Or you see these guys and go, oh, wait, because I'm always curious about that transition to, and my time looks like it could be there. Mm -hmm. But now you're in there and you go, no, wait, this is now my peer group. It's a new peer group. But that takes yeah. some adjustment. What's that transition like to where you go, I, I belong in this lane? I think and it with takes. This group? Yeah, I think it always takes me like a race or two because for me, going in, so I'm always more nervous for the prelims and semifinals than I am the final because the prelims and semifinals, you want to run hard, but you don't want to run too hard, whereas the final, you're just going. Mm -hmm. So for me, for the final, I was sitting there. I, whenever I'd get nervous, I'd think about it. I'm like, I mean, my PR is 47.4. If I just go out and just run hard, then I'll put myself in position to medal. And... Even then, like, I mean, was it weird the first day looking around at the warm track and like, oh, there goes Karsten or like, oh, there goes Allison. And it's so that was kind of had to get past that a little bit mentally. But it just it just takes a race for me. It takes like one race to kind of settle in mm -hmm. and being I will say being at indoor worlds helped a lot of like being on a global stage rep. And obviously 
outdoor is significantly more intense, at least for the 400 hurdles than indoor with the 400. But I do think that experience helped a lot. And then, like I told people in the media after USA's, if you make the USA team, you, you belong and you have a right. real shot to medal because this is not, it's the hardest team in the world to make. What is, what is your true. record, by the way, all time against Farholm? Want to know? Want to know? Not a lot of guys that are, that are, you know, yeah, they have an edge over him. That's pretty. Don't a, don't ask my record versus Rye Benjamin. <laughs> it's zero and seven. You were saying that you're a student of the sport. Are you a track nerd, like through and through? Yeah. What's an event you like that's not the four hundred hurdles, that maybe you know, maybe not even in the sprints. Yeah, like if just I, like, what's so, a, what, what's a, the the low key of the event that you're most excited that I, for? That, I that people that wouldn't expect at all. If I could, so I'll answer it this way: If I could choose any event to be good at that I don't do, it would be either hammer or triple jump. I can, the amount of minutes off my life I've wasted just watching like triple jump videos really? on like Instagram like the slow motion ones it's insane it's so cool to me and then hammer I feel like there's not a cooler feeling in the sport than the hammer you have those really fast turns and you just stick and let that thing go and you just watch it fly that has to be such a cool feeling it in no, practice they wouldn't let me really <laughs> hammer he, at least even Judd wouldn't he wouldn't give you a shot at that I asked him once, he said, do you, he's, he would always answer the same thing if a sprinter asked if they could throw a hammer. He'd be like, well, he's like, we'll take you out of the sprints. You're going to red shirt. You're going <laughs> to put on about 70, 80 pounds in a year. And then we'll talk. And I'm like, okay, so no, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it. Triple jump, my, my legs would snap. Yeah. yeah the, those, the, I, honestly, I think the triple jumper might be one of the best athletes in, it's so, in all of so the impressive you have to watch it in yeah. slow motion to really appreciate for thing. sure or if you just or the meets when they have like the mics next to the tracks you can hear the impacts it's insane yeah. and it, when it's done right it's one of the most graceful most elegant things when it's done well and then when it's done poorly and you look at like that guy looks like an absolute klutz right the, the line between really good in that event and and a guy who looks just amateurish is is remarkable i think the I think the top three probably coolest things in track that you could do after like an event or a race is the high jump. The bar is so high you walk underneath it. Oh, That's up there. Yeah. Um, like I said, the hammer you just throw, you just watch it go, you yell at it, point whatever. <laughs> longer <laughs> triple, longer triple jump. You land, you just get up and sprint out the pit because you know it's just You're a, a field far guy. jump. Oh, I love field events. Wow. Uh, and then obviously like the hundred, like Fred just pretty much ran a four hundred. <laughs> like you, you finish the hundred, you just keep running. Right. That has to be a really cool feeling. I, in my head, I picture like if I get a medal, like I'm like I'm just gonna take off running. I, my legs were so tired. I was ready, so I was like, I'll stay right here. I'll right. stay right here. Right. Fred ran what was a nine eight, and then he ran uh, forty eight for the four hundred. Yeah. That whole race as he just kept going around. Vernon sat in that seat and said he might try. A, an 800 next year would you drop in that race and make that's, a bet with him that's not funny <laughs> yeah. i'm not doing that no <laughs> i am i am not i've ran one 800 in my life how'd it go so it was after was when it faster than i ran today in the media 800 no the question oh, no yeah, i gotta ask how that went so he we was thrown up <laughs> so we had it was after winter break we had our first meet at the university of finley which is a 200 meter flat track nice and they said, Trevor, you can either run the 500 or the 600. I said, can I run the 800 instead? And they're like, yes, which I still to this day, I think that was a better choice. I've ran a 500 and I never want to do that again. I will not run a 600. It will not happen. But the 800 I ran after conversion for the flat track, too flat. All right, so I held you, you off just Yo, barely. Held me off. Do you go up against the Heidelberg seconds. student princes too, as well? They're they're a lot. I've, ra I've raised not, Heidelberg a time or ten. They're not not below you. Okay, that's <laughs> television's John Bucciagrass is a Heidelberg student prince. Oh, okay. That's why I asked. Yeah, Greater Ohio area. So Trevor, I mean, is there going to be a parade for you? But when you get back home, or what's what's, what's what's the plan? I mean, I'm going to have an ice cream cake in my house. I can, I don't know about a parade or nothing, but. Sounds Are you going better. to Denny's tonight, or oh well, you have to find out about the four x four. We got we gotta wait and see if they're if I'm in the four x four or not. Might might have to make a stop at Denny's. So the Denny's at the, near the team hotel has become the thing. Well, like like Tunde said, by the time you finish your event, everything's closed. 
Denny's 24 hours, and it is literally walking distance. And you it's find right there, yeah. Phone. You got the Outback, it, but that closes at 9. You can't yeah, be there. I mean, why, why, is, why are places closing so early still, man? Yeah, welcome to Eugene, <laughs> Oregon, right? Well, I'm, I'm from Ashland, and places don't close that early. <laughs> Trevor, before we go, we got to make sure that you sign the flag. Oh, yeah. for sure. Here it is. The this bronze. One. Definitely get. We want that, and then we definitely want a picture here. to commemorate. Yeah. yeah oh, this for side, sure. This here. side's gotten really empty over here. I will say, I noticed those cornhole boards back there. Yeah, you and can if go, there's, go if, throw some bags. If there's something us Ohio people know, it's cornhole. You guys call it <laughs> cornhole, not bags. Well, it's cornhole, so yeah. we call it cornhole. <laughs> you call it cornhole. So you got I, will, I, will, I will say uh, Stefan beat me yesterday. That, in, was, that was tough. In New York, we don't call it anything because no one has a backyard. <laughs> My boy Steve Levy, born out on Long Island, he used to tell me he went to summer camp, and that's the only time he saw grass. Yeah, yeah. He didn't have it in his yard. Goes. He goes, Anderson, you don't understand. Like, yeah. that's where we went to see grass. Well, in Long Island, I... I oh, I understand. love that. He threw in the 4739. Is he the first one to throw down a PR? Yeah, I... I that's how I, I signed my name. I signed my initials, underline, put the PR. Very cool. Wow. Dude, well, Trevor, the, the trial and error of trying to figure out a signature. <laughs> I, here's the thing. You my, practice at home? I practiced for so long. <laughs> and here's the thing. My name's Trevor. I don't know how to do a cursive V. <laughs> it's so, always a you. You always accidentally go I, you. I just, I just did a line. I just kind of did another line, went straight into the OR. And, but here's the thing. Trying to write Trevor Bassett in cursive just takes so long. And Judd told me he's like, he's, he's like, you want to put your PR on it? And, oh, uh, someone put their PR there. I think it was Trayvon. Um, he's like, and it needs to be quick. It needs to be something quick because if you're signing a lot. And I worked at the YMCA last summer. And there was a lot of downtime. So literally during downtime, I'd just sit there, <laughs> had a notebook just with just so many terrible signatures on it. But you finally came up with but one. But we got one. <laughs> But you want to make it so it's recognizable, right? Like you look at Ashton Eaton's Emma Bay, so that when I have that and mm -hmm. I look at it years from now, instead of going, "Well, what's that scribble?" Like I don't know who that is. That doesn't help me. Arnold Palmer used to, and he's nobody signed more autographs than Arnold Palmer, but he always said I wanted to write it so that people could read it and they'd know what it was. See, and that's the thing. You don't know if that's I, Trevor Bassett, Trayvon Bromel, I have Tom no Brady. Idea who I got that a lot. Is. I got it could good. Could be TB12. T TB's got some great company. My problem is that when you run 46 point. That this now well it helps you, you know can, you can, at what point you can in life you. it's literally yeah. a timestamp. So my fiance she bought a hat at Outdoor USA's and I signed it with the forty seven forty seven, and then literally after my race I signed it again with the forty seven thirty nine. So we're gonna have that hat that I'm gonna sign each time nice. I get a new PR. How's the momentum. wedding planning coming along? You gotta ask. Her. I haven't really done much of it. <laughs> that's right. You've been busy. By the I way, picked, that's the right answer. Yeah. Yeah. I you picked, need to nod and be in agreement, but without acting like you're being exactly. dismissive of what they say. <laughs> so there's just, a, so you know. Yeah. yeah. I I helped pick the tuxes that Good. me and the groomsmen are wearing. Better be black. It's uh, blue and burnt orange. Wow. Like wow. It. Yeah. See, really, wow. a really nice, a, a dark, oh, dark audience. blue will work. And you know what I think I'm gonna do. I'm just not even gonna do the orange tie. We might just have this Ooh. instead of the orange tie. Oh. That's that's it's close. It's close enough. Sure. I hate to put you on the spot. Does Rye get a late invite to the wedding? Best man. Yeah, probably. Best I'll, best pro I'll, pro I'll probably shoot him an invite. <laughs> President Rye. It's actually really funny because like obviously like the stories with me and Rye have been going crazy on social media. The best man of my wedding texted me said, "I heard I'm getting replaced as the best man." Uh, <laughs> I was like, "No, no, you guys are good. You guys were you are good." Were you there? Were you around when he got the shirt that somebody put Rye Benjamin for I, president? I pointed it out to him. Apparently, you're. Uh, he went through his cabinet. You'd be his secretary of defense. Yeah. I'll take it. Yeah. 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 So you I'll saw. So it. the person was wearing this and then gave it to Rye. Yeah. Rye traded his jersey for it. Yeah. <laughs> so he, So we're walking the lap, and at this point, they have us in lane one and two to like not do pictures or anything because they're like, we we got to go to the media. And then I hear the guy say, like, I hear the kid yell, and he's loud. I look over, and I just see the black shirt with Rye's face on it. says, Rye Benjamin. I, go, I was like, Rye. Rye. He's like, what? And I just pointed at him. And then I didn't realize it, because then he walked back by me. I was like, you got the shirt? He's like, I traded my jersey for it. <laughs> oh, my God. That's well, a, that kid came out ahead. Yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Trevor yeah, Secretary of Defense, I'll take that. It's a title. <laughs> Last thing before we let you Cabin go, <laughs> you obviously know we're big fans of you. You share a lot of our stuff. Do you got anything nice to say about City Smack? You can look into that camera right there. Oh, right they've there, been organic, know. and now you finally. <laughs> it has not been that organic. Not been that organic. <laughs> <laughs> what What did the New York Post say about you guys? 
Or New York, New York Times. Times. We're New York the Times, track and the field website. Is a rag. You don't yeah. want that. You said this what? We're the track and field website. I feel like you guys are more than the track and field website now. I feel like you're becoming the track and field account. Because with you guys, what helps a lot is like you guys are very, you're very open, relatable. You have former athletes. So you can kind of get these more personal answers. Not so, I went to run the race. Um, <laughs> I just I heard the gun and I Stay reacted. In my lane, just ran kinda, my race. Just yeah. Stuck to like, the race plan. Like you get the very real reactions of like me like trash talking hurdle eight for most of my <laughs> career to try to get through it mid race. So I think that's really I think that's gonna help grow the sport, grow athletes, and it's something that you guys are really setting the bar for. Thank you, Trevor. Trevor, yeah. you're and good for this moment. And right? they pay me ten bucks. Won't get out of bed for less wait, than twenty two thousand. Have you guys paid anyone else to be on this yet? No. Are know. you going to? No. You better not be lying You're to me. Sponsor. No, we know you like the NILs. Yeah, I'm all about it. You don't it. need that anymore, though. Get, you got get that. the big money. <laughs> let's go. Right <laughs> all right, let's take a quick picture. Yeah, yeah for sure. quick picture, right. and then we'll good. bring on our next guest. Is the next guest here? Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Say. All right. Say say He's so tall in person. <laughs> get the money. Six four. Actually, it actually depends. If I get asked for sports, I say six four. If I get asked in person, I'm six three. Sure. In reality, I'm like I think I'm like medically a six three and three quarter, and nobody says that. <laughs> nobody Wait, says that. No, we round up around here. See, high, ju high jumpers always change their height. How tall are you? Six three, and then you, or you, you say I'm I'm six three, and then you jump six three, and you go, well, I'm actually six two and a half, because you want to say you've jumped over your head. So you gotta be. Trevor, feel free know. to take some tracksmith stuff for you. Or yeah, your take whatever you want. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you can take whatever you want. We got a couple boxes out there. You could uh, okay, rummage through. Well, my fiance's a big tracksmith gal. So. Okay. There you go. There you go. Mm. Thank you guys. Of course. Give it up for Trevor Bassett, everybody. All right. Good player. Coming to the set next, we've got the NCAA champion, NCAA record holder, and the world championship finalist, Courtney Wayman, who just signed with uh, on, uh, on not too long ago. Yeah. So and now Courtney. she's on here. It, and now come she's on here. Hey, there's one chair up? left. It's for you. I think you grabbed that mic go. right there. So she's back. You've been hanging out for a little while. Trevor had some stories to share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been here. Well, I'm sure Trevor's been here a little bit longer than me, but it's been a week, so it's been good. Yeah, look, the fresh kicks are right there. Those That's are right. I know. How, how long have those been out of the box? Uh, just this week. Wow. We got them for World Championships. So this side says World Championships Whoa. 2022. And this side says Taylor Made, because, you know, Dang. we're Taylor Made by yeah. Coach T. Very cool. Wow. Wow. I know. That's so they, cool. They made them real special, which they're fun. I love that stuff. What have you made of this whole Team USA experience? It's been incredible. I've, I've just been trying to soak in all the little things from, you know, eating breakfast and lunches and dinners with everyone at the hotel and um, getting to go to the on house and meeting all of the on people and racing against the best in the world like i've just been trying to soak it all in and be really grateful because it's it's a cool experience and it's kind of hard to describe without you know being here i'm you guys get it yeah i feel like you're like august is going to be a bit of a letdown because we we are first ncaa title so that's amazing and then then we make the national team then you come to the world like each one of these individually in any one season would be an accomplishment to string these together in the matter of six weeks is astonishing how do we compartmentalize like this is a blur all these things have happened yeah it's it's been moving fast mm -hmm. but um i it's just been so fun like ncaa's was awesome it was the you know kiss of goodbye to my collegiate career and i couldn't think of a better ending for it and then you know signing with on has just been incredible and they they treat me so well and I love it. And so that was so fun. And then to debut in my kit, make the team. Um, I think you just take it one one meet at a time and like one thing at a time and then be grateful for the time that you're in, you know, because it does it for me. It's changed so fast and things are changing a lot in the last mm -hmm. month. But it's it's been really, really good. So between the USA team and all the people at ON, do you have a new best friend? Like, was there someone, an, <laughs> an athlete that you really just connected with, uh, you know, on this trip? 
Yeah, honestly, there's been a lot. Me and Alicia, we called it our little um, breakfast club. <laughs> oh, <yeah? laughs> we go meet with like um, Bryce Hopple and Hillary and Evan and um, Josh Thompson, and that was kind of the main main people. Um, there was more like Bernard and um, Tibet from the marathon. So we had a couple different people but that was kind of the crew that i had been hanging out for the last couple of days and they're all phenomenal people we just we had good laughs and good times is it kind of like college where you're just sitting in the door uh, sitting in like the dining hall for two hours like you finished eating forever ago but there's nowhere to be so we might as well just sit here and have another cup of coffee and just hang out <laughs> A hundred percent. I think one night we spent from like 645 or seven until like 920, just <laughs> hanging out. Everyone else had gone, you know, up to their rooms or whatever. But yeah, very much so like that. We just been talking about anything, you know, that is, I guess, the, the cool part to that. Maybe the fans don't get to hear about too often where it's, you know, Trevor was just here talking about how he opened up and shared his story to Rye Benjamin. And then they, you know, share this incredible moment. How much of it is that where you kind of you, you can watch some interviews with people, but, you know, throughout training and in this whole time, like you're just focused on yourself. And when you're here, you're you know, next to some of these other athletes that, you know, you don't need a laptop or Instagram or anything like that. You can just have a conversation and get to know the other uh, people on the team. How much of it is sharing each other's stories? I think a lot of it. I think for me, um, you know, just coming from the NCAA world, I see all these people, you know, all Team USA racing and I'll watch their races and, you know, try to keep mm -hmm. up on all those things. But then you meet them in person and you get to know who they are. And I love it. It makes it way more than the sport. And I think it just connects all of us and reminds us that like we all are just normal humans. You know, we're just doing our things and we're having a good time with it. And so I think it is a lot of connecting through our own stories. And you just find out the coolest things about people and like what they've gone through in their lives to reach this point. And everyone's journey looks so different. And Everyone can connect with that because everyone, you know, everyone has different trials that they go through to get here. You probably have those moments where like Evan Jager's like, nice to meet you. I'm Evan. And it's like, <laughs> I, I, I know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> yes. Yes. We, yeah. I'm yeah. familiar. It, has there been anyone that, you know, you're one of the younger athletes on the mm -hmm. team. Has there anyone that you've been a little starstruck by or it's like, oh, I'm so it's so cool that I get to finally like meet this person yeah I don't I don't know if I've been starstruck um I feel like I've really tried to um just remember that everyone's human and um but it's been cool it's been cool to see people that have paved the path for me like I remember you know Emma and Courtney and Evan from the steeple when I was in high school when I was kind of starting to first run and you know really get serious about running and so meeting them it's like cool you guys paved such an awesome path and like I get to be on this journey because you guys put a lot into it to put us on the maps. And so I think that's been like, I wouldn't say starstruck, but I would just say like very grateful for what they've done. And then it's cool that now I can be like, oh yeah, now we're friends, you know? <laughs> How about if we flip that the other way around? Because when Trevor was just out here, he said, whoa, Rye Benjamin knew my name. Has anybody come up to you and said, hey, Courtney, and you went, that person knew my name. Yeah, I mean, Rye today came up to me and gave me a hug and was like, I watched you last night. You did so good. He's and I was fan, like, huh? thank yeah, you. Cool. Yeah, they're just, I mean, we're all watching each other. And But yeah, Rye came up to me today and I was like, oh, you're so nice. <laughs> like Vernon came up to me right before this. So right. it's been fun. Rye could just be looking for votes. That's yeah, for president. Yeah, yeah. So, That's right. uh, we visited immediately after the NCAA championship when you run that and run mm -hmm. 916 and you told the story about uh, the young lady that was there in the stands watching the NCAA championship and never qualified. Uh, if you could retell that for our audience about how that motivated you to the first big championship you had this 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 summer, which was the NCAA's. Yeah, so um, in 2017, that was my freshman year of um, college, and I was running the steeple, and I was having a, a good season back then, and um, I ended up having a little hiccup in the middle of the season, and so my regionals meet wasn't – it, it wasn't spectacular. It wasn't great. We'd kind of made the stretch goal of can we make it to NCAAs and I had one of my teammates make it. And so we had a couple, yeah, a couple of my teammates like Whitney and Shay in the eight and the 15, Christy mm -hmm. in the steeple. And so um, my parents were so nice. They, I really wanted to be there. And so they drove me out here from Utah. And um, I just remember sitting in the steeple final and I was 
just so ecstatic but I I was a little sad because I was like I would give anything to be on that track and be racing and I can remember who was in the race I can remember who won I can remember all the things but um I just remember sitting there like one day that's gonna be me I'm gonna be doing that and so um you know to then now in 2022 get that opportunity um I felt inspired by those women and I hoped that whatever mm-hmm. I was doing could help inspire that next generation. Were you the high schooler or the middle schooler that loved running and like knew you wanted to grow up and one day be here on the City of Smag live <laughs> <laughs> podcast? Um, Dream come true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fine. Um, or, or was that something that you only developed later on in college as the success really started to pick up? I would say definitely later on. Um, my both my parents ran in college, and so where they were they BYU? Um, they were at Weber State. Okay. Yeah. Good yeah. Rivalry. Yeah. Uh, I would. I don't know if I would say rivalry. Whoa, that, oh. now you're, that's how you start rivalries. <laughs> right. <I think. laughs> no, whole, they definitely, they definitely still love Weber State, but uh, I think I've, I think I've got them to bleed blue, <laughs> if I'm being honest. But um, yeah, no. So they made. I have four older siblings, and they made my older siblings all run. And they all hated it. And so maybe hate's a strong word, but they didn't want to continue with it. And so when it got to me, my parents were like, we're not putting up that fight. We're just not doing that. And so um, I loved soccer. That was like the sport that I loved. It was my first love of a sport. And in seventh grade, we had to run the mile in gym. And I ran this mile and my gym teacher said, oh, you ran a 558 mile. And I, so I called Wait, what my, year? my seventh grade year. And That's so like what I was running. <laughs> they were telling me the same thing. That's what I'm running right now. Yeah. <laughs> you could have been a great women's people chaser. Is that what they were telling yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, so I I had called my dad and I'm like, hey, they said I ran a 558 mile. And my dad was like, mm, you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And I was like, no, I don't think I am. 1500. Yeah. 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 And so he's, like, doesn't lie. he's like, well, it's on the grass, Courtney. So it's for sure short. And I was like, <laughs> So so mad. He was really so, hyping you up. That's yeah, what they, no, that's what they say about like, you in sophomore. Beating you down. <laughs> yeah, he and so then I'm like, no. So then the next week I ran it again. And I was like, I ran a five fifty two this time. And he was like, No, you didn't. Oh my And then he God. was like, Court, I think it's short, if I'm gonna be honest. And I was like, Oh, that's rude. He's playing so, chess right yeah, now. Yeah, reverse like, psychology. Yeah. And um I ended up running track that season. <laughs> on, was, a full, on a full size track? On a full okay, size good. track. Okay, good. So all the times yes. were legitimate then? Yeah, so we had the 1600 in, in seventh grade, and so that's where I started running. But I, I just did running just because it was fun, and it was a way to keep in shape for soccer. And then it wasn't until about the middle of my junior year of high school that I was like, okay, I, I think I could have a shot in the future of this and, you know, go to college for mm-hmm. running. So It sounds like your parents are pretty supportive. They, yeah. you know, driving you to, <laughs> but Ash, you know, right. they, they come dr- a long way from telling you that you didn't really do that. To, <laughs> that was almost, we drive that, was the, that was the strategy they right. knew. It was a strategy. They always joke about that. I'm like, <laughs> you guys got me. You wrapped me into it for sure. Do they give you advice at the still or at what point were they like, all right, I think uh, she's the expert now. I think, um, I mean, in high school, they'd give me a lot of advice just because I had no idea what I was doing. My dad would be like, hey. I'd come home from practice and he'd be like, hey, you have to run this race on this day. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so that was kind of the relationship of running that we had. Um, but more so now, like once I got to college, my parents, it's just something special that I can bond with them. You know, I could call them after a workout and be like, oh my gosh, this is an awesome workout. And they get it. Like I, I can explain the splits and they totally understand. And so it's more so of a special bond, I would say. I don't know if they maybe they insert their advice but um it's just yeah it's just more of a special bond so are you the password child now right yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's what we learned about earlier yeah. the other four didn't run are they now like okay your birthday is the is the passcode to everything and she they update the the numbers every time she runs a pb <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> hey, the password's been changed a couple right. times in the past couple of weeks oh gosh uh Listen, I don't think they have favorites, but if they did, <laughs> I might be. This is also how rivalries start. <laughs> yeah. Sibling rivalries, yes, when they come through there. Uh, so uh, over the past couple months, I guess, we what we saw when you ran the record uh, at the NCAA championship and then you run even faster at the U.S. championships. Coming around, I guess, to the world championships, was it 
sort of like you just wanted to keep this train going and like each time around i think like in the mix zone when you'd spoken to to the media you had said like i don't think i've you know tapped into what i think the ceiling is yet and you were surprising yourself each time around what were the expectations going into worlds I think the expectations going to the world into worlds is we did have high expectations. I felt like I could place very high here and I felt like I had a chance to do something that I didn't know that I was even capable of a month ago, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like the expectations were high and um, I am fit and, and I didn't know my ceiling. I feel like every single time I had finished the steeple, I was like, oh man, I still got some in the tank. Like if I go out harder. And so that was kind of, we wanted to test that in the final of like, okay, how hard are we going to go out and put yourself in it? And we, we went out blazing fast, mm -hmm. which I respect, but, um, yeah, it, I mean, we saw like, okay, that's probably a little too fast to go out. So I think, I did have high expectations and you always want a PR that is like, that's fun, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, I think we had high expectations, but you know, you just don't know what's going to happen and you don't know how it's going to feel. You don't know how the race is going to be run. So does coach Taylor change sort of the way she game plans with you or pumps you up before? Cause we've seen it, I guess, like at the NCAA level on TV sometimes at the NCAA championships, but, uh, for a U.S. championships and then worlds. Like what's she like, I guess, in the moments leading up to the race? She's very even kill all the time. Okay. I mean, you know, she's she's very um, into it and always yeah. hyping us up, which I love. But She hyped she, us up. We were just like walking our house the other morning. <laughs> right. and she, she gave like, us Keep up the great work. Yeah, we got a little yeah. pump up speech. Yeah, she's the ultimate hype woman. <laughs> you, need feel, you need to feel real good about yourself. But the thing is about her, she's so brutally honest that – when she says that she believes in you, like, you just know, because you're like, she would not say that if she didn't think that I actually had a shot at doing whatever that end goal looks like. And But going from NCAAs and USAs and Worlds, she she treats it all the same, like, in in the best way of, we know what to do, we know how to take care of business, so let's go and enjoy it. And, like, let's have fun. Like, this sport is so fun, and what we're doing is, like, you don't know what the future holds. And so... Um, yeah, that's kind of been the attitude of all three different races that I've had in the last. She never weeks. seems that steady and calm to me during the race. <laughs> oh, during the race, right? Like she's the best, you know. And I always say it's amazing to me that that runners in those long races can hear their coach's voice through all the other voices that are running. When you're, but in her, there's no question. Like, okay, everybody can hear her, even if you're not a BYU athlete, you can hear her when For she comes sure. through, right? She's yeah. not even keel at all. What kind of things is she yelling at you? Because it's not like you can really change a lot at this point, right? You're in the middle of this. Have you ever just thought, how about you just be quiet right now? I'll be fine. <laughs> no, I, so specifically in the steeple, I'm I'm big. Like, if you go look at a lot of my other races, I like to, like, look at her once a lap. I'm like, are we good? You know, right. we got to be on the same wavelength. But, like, the steeple, I come off the water jump. She's the first person I will kind of, like, mm -hmm. you know, make a side eye at. Um, but, yeah, you can always hear her but that's just who she is she's so passionate and it's like she's in the race with you you know whether you're on the back stretch if she needs mm -hmm. to yell something at you you know it's going to be there but you're kind of not doing it solo but yeah she's i love the energy she brings it is it is unmatched something that last night we went to this pop-up dinner that michael stember put on and our older listeners will remember the name but he was an olympian 2000 and he was coached by Frank Agliano and Vin Lanana. So Mac and I were very excited to meet him and talk to him. And we we're discussing after that there's like this coaching tree. Mm -hmm. And I think Mac is already mapping it out and how like everyone, you know, probably what like Arthur Lydiard down to Bill Bowerman and Bill Dellinger to like Gags and Vin. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like because Diljeet has that Gags connection, I am always rooting for her athletes. But something that I think is really unique is she's one of the top premier female coaches now in the world. Mm -hmm. How is it being coached by a female? I th it's it's really special. We were talking about it yesterday before the race that like I don't know if there's another woman personal coach here with their woman athlete. And so, you know, it's it's really cool to see what she's been able to do. I know that. Um, I've only been with her for six years, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, only. but, you know, hearing all, she, she gives us little snippets of, you know, where she's been and what she's had to do to get where she's at. And 
that's it's like very inspirational that she works very hard to be where she's at and doing what she's doing as a coach and like that is inspirational as an athlete but um yeah and she talks so highly of gags too like Mm -hmm. so highly and and it, it makes me happy that she has that relationship still with gags so you know hoping that's what my future looks like with her that I because that human connection between coaches and you know I still go visit gags I bring my daughter over and we we pop in for visits but like you guys are friends like beyond it's not just an average coach athlete relationship and the way you guys speak and I mean your decision to stay with her beyond college seemed like a relatively easy one right yeah very easy I mean you're right it is it does go beyond there is such a level of trust and like just the bond that her and I have formed has been so special. It's, and I mentioned it a couple of times, but it, it truly is one of the best relationships that I have in my life. She's filled a lot of roles for me and it's fun that we kind of, you know, are mm-hmm. growing together. This is a new thing for not just me, but for her too, as a professional coach. And so it's, it's fun growing with her. Well, you guys have now an extreme, you had a very good <laughs> college team, but now you're a pro group with, yeah. it's Courtney, Anna, yourself who's like yeah Whitney Anna and me Whitney Annie yeah, sorry you're um fine. <laughs> oh, this is we've interviewed too much <laughs> you're fine. this week um but we talked at USA's that there might be a name reveal of the group at one point yeah. do we have a name yet we do but um you'll have to wait for the oh, Instagram <laughs> <man>. stay tuned <laughs> when, when is the wait when's the big reveal should be very very soon okay. we, we were hoping but it kind of got crazy in between USA's and worlds listen she's unique but I think there's other women coaches especially distance that are doing it like Lori Hennis is amazing at NC mm-hmm. State and hop at Minnesota like there are some tremendous tremendous female coaches and I think especially in distance and maybe I'm just parroting now having talked to Diljeet but women's distance running can be such a, a fine line between what is healthy and what can be really hard on an athlete. And to have a female coach there, I think is is unbelievably supportive and really um, needed many times. Like we need more women brought into the sport with them, but there are some great ones. But I listen to her all the time and I think, my gosh, because my youngest daughter's 18, but I thought like, I might have another child just so she could run for her, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like she's that yeah. impressive. And we talked about her having had coaching opportunities. And I'm like, how could you handle 85 athletes with the care and the compassion that she has for the smaller, just the women's team she had, right? She, her investment in all of you is astounding. It really is. I Something that she has always said from day one is she was like, if you give me 100%, I will give you 200%. And she... Good deal. She, it is, it's a phenomenal <laughs> yeah. deal, honestly. Right. Two for one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, she... She's done that and she upholds her end of the deal and and she shows up every year with a new energy and a new way of like, we're going to elevate better than the last year and it's looked different every year, but um, that's something that's special about her that she Mm -hmm. just comes every single year with a new way of elevating us. Even during, you know, COVID and all these things, she was like, oh, we're doing team TikToks. You have to send in a specific TikTok and you got to get this in here. And who has the better banana bread recipe? And, (laughs) you know, even in ways that like, you don't know how she's going to do it, but she always does it. And I'm amazed because some things she seems to be very fanatical about controlling. Here's what we're going to wear. Here's what we're going to look. And yet, Team dinners, right? Sometimes it's it's the seniors, the upperclassmen get to pick what we wear and these kind of like some of the unique things that she's created that that you enjoyed over the years. What are what are some of those that you would share with people and say, this is what's unique, unique about the program I, I ran in? Yeah, I think the matching thing um, and like stuff like that, I think that's unique because we want to um, we want to present ourselves as we are one. We are all together and we are unified in that one. Um, But something that, like you mentioned, the pre-race dinners and things like that is um, all those traditions that we have, whether it's, you know, she writes us a card before every single race um, or like pre-race dinners we had when, you know, just with her and I um, for Worlds this time. And she decorated a whole wall of all the countries in the world and put pictures of me from the prelims race up on there and, she, she does all these things um, and something that I know myself, you know, when I was at BYU and the rest of the upperclassmen is we've really bought into what she's doing. And so she sets the precedence, but then we want to cultivate that. We want to capture that. So she does this, but 
um, something that she does such a good job of from the time we're freshmen and then really allowing us to buy in. And so I think all the unique things about um, the BYU women's team is, you know, all the things that Coach Taylor does, like write us notes and do you know, have all do your these. cards? I do. I have every <laughs> single card she's ever given me. I'm gonna scrapbook it one day. <laughs> but it's sitting in, they're sitting in. I call it my special box, and it's like all my running things. Oh, that's amazing. So I asked Corey McGee this question yesterday, and she gave a wonderful answer. And you take a deep breath and like think about it okay. for a few seconds okay. before. So. You know, you're not in college anymore. Now you're a professional athlete. This is your job. And part of that is having fans. You know, like now now you're no longer just running for yourself and your team. Like you're running for, you know, on. Yeah. Like you, you're trying to move some shoes. And uh, <laughs> But, you know, of all the elite athletes out there, why should fans, whether it be a little girl or a 31-year-old podcaster – root for you like why should you be someone's favorite runner why should they get the poster of you on the wall like what is it that you think you have that could really resonate now as a professional rather than just being a collegiate athlete it's a very hard question it's hard that you can take a, a deep question. breath yeah and, yeah i need to think about that and it definitely requires like a level of self-reflection yeah uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um Something that I think about myself that I've, I've really worked hard in the last six years to try to grow into that person is being really personable and making it more than the sport. That is something I, I want to make it more than the sport. I want it to be something that everyone feels like they can see parallels in their life um, through myself and my running. And whether that is, you know, an aspiring 15, 17, however old girl or if it's a 30 year old mom or a 40 year old mom that's like, I really want to, you know, do this better in my life or whatever. I, I really want that to be the thing where it's it's personal and it's showing the highs, it's showing the lows. It's just being real and um, making it more than the sport. And then most importantly, like having fun. This is something that like, yes, it is now my job. But this is what we get to do. Like, that is mm -hmm. so fun. Like, I get to show up every single day. So I just don't ever want to lose that fun. But I, I think those two things would be the answer of why yeah. I think, you know, hopefully people would want to follow along with me. Well, for those who weren't in the mix zone at USA's or Worlds, like I can commend you on it, you immediately are excited to talk to the media. And you'll give everyone all the time in the world so happy to chat. And even after a race, I mean, minutes after finishing, you're like, see ya in the city at some hag podcast show. Like, you know, and yeah. so I, not, you don't you don't have to do those sort of things. Like you can walk through the mix zone. You can be Kurt in those conversations. You don't have to come here, but like you seem like you enjoy doing it and want to do it. So for that reason, you're easy to root for for us. Thanks. Well, I mean, it's nice. I mean, you guys are here doing your best look into career. this camera you guys, you're gonna you guys are anything. all here <laughs> here to promote the sport and it's it's great for the sport it's something that like oh. it resonates with all of us and and it's special you guys are there taking your time because you're you want to hear what i have to say and that's the least least i can do is chat with you and like be candid and be honest about you know whatever is going on post race what's the first final like when you go through global championship final you see Wow, three gals just ran under nine minutes. Right? Is that, um, which is always good to have a goal, but you've yeah. been in that race. Like, you've never been in a race like that before. And I'll yeah. come down there and you go, wow, that is, I ran my heart out, I ran a PR, and up front they ran 853. At, yeah. at some point, that's got to be a, it's a what? It's a shocking thing. It's a just, you know, to be a part of that. Yeah, I think for um, a moment in time there last night, I was a little, I was a little sad of like, oh man, I was disappointed. I had high goals. I didn't feel like that, but. Then you look at these women and the times that they're running and you know it's kind of like me in 2017 where i was like one day i want to do that and that's how i feel right now is i'm mm -hmm. like i will take my 12th and i will be proud of that 12th but one day i'm going to do that mm -hmm. and so that's what i look at it is like because i'm like that's incredible but one day 
I'm going to do that. When you were talking to your teammates, by the way, did you introduce yourself to Courtney as the collegiate record holder? In the <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Courtney. I'm, <laughs> no. Courtney, I, I have no. Made, okay. I just no, wondered, no. Because you could, you know. I, I you could. You could let her know. <laughs> I'm the Courtney that has the NCAA record in the steeplechase. No. Okay. No, we normally. Maybe not the best opener. You're not <laughs> that good at making friends, John, huh? <laughs> Maybe not the best opener, but you never know. <laughs> Courtney, yeah. what's the plan from here? Like, is it uh, shutting it down? Looking at some diamond leagues, some Europe meets. What do you What do you have in, uh, over the next couple of weeks? Yeah, so on the schedule we have Monaco on Ooh. August 10th. Have you so. been in that part of the world? Jet no, I've, you. <laughs> I've never been to Europe, so wow. it's exciting. I hear it's nice. Yeah, first yeah. diamond league race, so I'm excited. That's that's the first thing on the list, and then uh, we'll kind of play it by ear after that. What a start! <laughs> yeah. yeah, you gotta get on I a know. yacht. Well, we'll, we'll, see, take, we'll, we'll you have see to take the helicopter that. from the airport because if you fly into Nice, they give you an option. I think between like the uh, a bus or cab or a helicopter, always take the helicopter. So when they come the on price this trip difference? with me, just what? tell me. Is there a price? Difference? I think it's like from the meat, the meat organizers uh, like give you that option. Oh so when you gosh. get approached with that, and they go, awesome. do you want to run in Monaco? Do you like surrender on the spot, or do you really have to think, okay? Is this the right race for me? Because I feel like I would just be like, yeah. When when do we when do we leave? I I'm similar to that where I'm like, <laughs> sign me up. Yeah. This sounds great. Yeah. And um, yeah, like I've been talking about our training, but Coach Taylor has, you know, we've been planning to be able to go a little bit longer this season. Um, and that, it was nice not having cross country. So I kind of mm -hmm. did get a little bit of what the real pro life looks like. And so, but yeah, I mean, getting that kind of opportunity, that's, that's incredible, you know, and it's my, it'll be my first international, not in, on right. U.S. soil and Diamond League. So yeah, incredible opportunity. I'm, I'm amped about it. I think it's the first of many and we're super excited to see where your career goes from here, Courtney. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. This yeah, has been great. Thanks for having me guys. Appreciate it. Anytime. So that does it for another episode of Sidious Mag live at Worlds. We'll catch you again tomorrow. We're working on our uh, guest list. As always, you can stay put on Instagram and Twitter, and we'll drop those in the morning. Actually, the one person I think we do have confirmed so far is USATF uh, CEO Max Siegel, which uh, I think, do we have to wear suits for that one, Kyle? <laughs> yeah, I know. He yeah. his own show. <laughs> that, yeah, no, that's going to be exciting. I mean, that was an idea that we had, a, you know, a couple of weeks before the, you know, even coming to Eugene, we are saying it'd be really cool to sit down with Max. Uh, you know, he doesn't do that many podcasts. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we're, we're excited to, I, I don't know, I've maybe met him once years ago. And so I'm going to definitely have plenty of questions and excited to chat. Yeah. And then Ry Benjamin was, unfortunately had to scratch from coming today <laughs> on the show, but hopefully we're going to try and get him, uh, tomorrow. And after the 200s, who knows who from Ooh. that field we might be able to get. So, uh, thanks everyone for watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel for, uh, all our interviews from the mix zone this show and our daily podcast that we're doing every night. So we'll see you guys again tomorrow.